Well, it's past seven o'clock, so let's get underway. Um, this is the Sherburn Zoning Board of Appeals Zoom meeting. It's being recorded. It's March 25th. Uh, it's a few minutes after seven. Um, <clears throat> we have a, it's the continued hearing on uh, 31 Hunting Lane and 41 North Main Street to uh, conjoined um, 40B projects. Um, Lynn Sweet was kind enough to send around an agenda with a number of items that she wants to cover. We have, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five preliminary matters we have to cover first, um, but hopefully they won't take very long. Uh, first up is the issue of when our 180 day hearing period ends. Uh, Mr. Terry, I hope you have a view on it and I'm hoping to hear that Mr. Haverty agrees with you, but you have the floor, Mr. Terry. Okay, <clears throat> so my reading of it goes like this. The uh, hearing uh, was open October 29th. Uh, at that point, the uh, governor's state of emergency was in place. And so under Chapter 53, the Acts of 2020 uh, deadlines uh, for this process were told. Uh, that ended Chapter 201 of the Acts of 2020, ended the tolling as of December 1st. So by my calculation, that means that the 180 days starts running on December 1st, which would be May 30th, and that's a Sunday. So it would be May 31st was official. All of you, uh, you see it the same way or? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna <clears throat> have to hate to shock you on this, but I actually agree with that. Oh my God. Wonderful. <laughs> always, always <laughs> glad to see you agree. Um, I'll, uh, I'll try not to do that too often. Yeah, well, no, 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 don't, don't, don't stop <laughs> now. You're on a roll. <laughs> uh, but maybe Paul, if I could ask you to drop a, a line to the board or to Mike or someone just so we have a record that we've all agreed it's May 31st and- sure. Then, then, and then, then, uh, and then obviously the, uh, and then obviously the, uh, it would be three, four days, three days after that. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> next up in the batting order, and um, another topic on which I'm sure you are both in complete agreement, uh, 61B and the town's rights, uh, whatever they may be. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Terry, would you like to tell us uh, what you can tell us about where the two of you are on the town's rights? Right, so uh, uh, we did uh, serve an appraisal uh, on um, the applicant landowner and, uh, and council Paul here on March 3rd. Um, we've had exchanged a few emails. Um, they haven't uh, to this point provided us with a counter appraisal or taken any other action, but we've, uh, we've agreed that um, my office is planning to meet with the select board uh, next Thursday and we will then hold a response to Paul, and we've agreed to extend the date by which he could provide us with a counter appraisal if he was going to do that by April 13th. So, so we're in the process, um, and nothing, uh, nothing hard and fast has happened as of yet. Mr. Haberty. Well, I uh, again, I would agree with Attorney Terry. Um, so we, we we did receive the appraisal. We provided a. a a list of concerns that we had with it. Um, we have asked the select board to reconsider uh, the appraisal that they submitted. And, and that's why we are waiting for them to have the opportunity to have another meeting to respond to the list of concerns that we provided. Um, and you know, either they're going to agree with us that uh, the appraisal was not timely and not done in a proper manner um, or they're going to disagree with, agree, disagree with us and we'll reserve our rights to take whatever actions are necessary from that point. Right. And I, I, I think you'll both agree with me uh, that the current procedural status with this board is the issue of whether or not uh, this developer had site control under the statute was left open in our vote of October 29. We agreed to defer it because the facts might change. Mr. Havity has reserved all his rights to say the town either has no rights or exercised them improperly. And Mr. Terry has reserved all the town's rights to say, no, no, we got you and, and we're going to we're going to get this property. Um, is that a fair sort of high level summary? Uh, yes. Yeah. So in, uh, just to, to be uh, clear on the procedure. So if if your board were at some point to determine and um, decide that um, that there had been a substantial change in circumstances with respect to site control, um, the regulations provide that you would then write a letter to the uh, 
uh, to mass housing, advising them of that. That's the process. So if we ever get to that point, we can touch base again. And, but that's the uh, that's the way the regs go. Okay, great. Is, Mr. Haber, do you agree with all that? Yes, it is. <clears throat> that is exactly the process that's set forth in the regulations. Okay. So speaking of 61B, here is our next topic, number three. Mr. Mills, I see you're on. Yes. Okay, Mr. so Mr. Chairman, Mills. Yes. Rick, uh, it's Paul Bokikio, 41th in Wayne. Can I comment on the second item before we get to the third item? Uh, sure. Um, the, uh, the letter from town council containing the appraisal went to the developer and that was published on the town website. Can the response from the developer and the back and forth from council be, pub be publicly uh, shown so everybody can see what's going on? That's up to the two lawyers. Uh, Some of it, Paul, will probably be seen by either or both of them as, as confidential or privileged. Um, if they, they submit written materials to our board, that puts it out in the open. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, but council, I'll mm -hmm. let you speak for yourself on the request. Yeah, I think at this point, all the all our uh, uh, communications have been confidential. I mean, we could look at that. I I wasn't I didn't consider that or you know think about that question before tonight. Uh, we could we could take a look at that. Yeah, but you could I, read. You know, if there's something you want to redact, you know, that's fine. Um, I just think, you know, we're interested in you know, the arguments on both sides and, you know, your, uh, you know, cover letter and the appraisal was public. So <clears throat> well, cer certainly public. if there's a, is there, if there's a formal response from the applicant that gets, you know, <clears throat> sent, sent to the board, um, then that will certainly be part of the record and be a public document. Um, and we haven't got that yet. So at this point, all, all, point, all there is, is my, my, our appraisal, and my letter. And Paul, to defend the two lawyers, the, the principle of confidential settlement uh, discussions can also be uh, can be a little bit frustrating to people on the sidelines, but that's the point, is that they're trying to get the settlement. Um, and so sometimes not all of us get to see all of the sausage being made. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> all right, Mr. Mills. Um, you uh, were rep representing your butter group or not representing as a lawyer, but as sort of the designated party for your butters group, which I'll call the hunting lane of butters, um, wrote on the 24th. And uh, your suggestion was that our board um, kick out both applications um, on the grounds of lack of site control. Is that fair characterization of your letter or do you want to say more? Yes, that's a fair characterization. That's the same argument that we made several months ago uh what's happened between then and now of course is that the appraisal was not only obtained but it's been delivered pursuant to the statute and as a result we feel that it's a waste of this board's time energy and resources to continue working on these projects when the town has this uh right of first refusal and is proceeding to uh exercise it uh, or at least put itself in a position where it may exercise it. So at, at a minimum, we think that you should, as a board, you should vote to uh, stay your hearing uh, pending the resolution of the 61B issues. Okay, uh, a, a, a fair ask and I hear it. Uh, board members, this gives us a chance to sort of reconsider the choices we made back in October. Um, I will tell you that my own view is that we probably ought to stay the course. Um, the reason for taking the position we did in October, which was to leave the issue open, was because the facts might well change. And of course they have changed dramatically since October. But uh, the, the opera, the back and forth is not yet over. And I would say that trying to either reach a conclusion now that they definitely do have site control or definitely don't uh, is, is risky for the board. Um, we have a 180 day clock that's going to run whether we try to stay it or not. I, I do not see in the regulations, Mike, tell me if I'm wrong, any uh, right of ours to just say, sorry, that 180 days is cold while we wait something else out. I think it is wise for the board to continue down the path we're going on and let the facts develop. But 
How do the two of you feel? Well, I, I, I basically agree with that, um, at least through the end of May. Well, you're right. We'll, we'll have to make, if we get to May and are making a decision, we'll have to agree right. in the decision a, uh, how, how to handle that issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Rick, I, I agree with what you said. Uh, we need to uh, see the facts develop further before we can conclude uh, issue of site control, see what the town ends up doing. Uh, okay. Um, I, I don't think from a uh, procedural standpoint, we're required to take a formal vote on this. There's been a suggestion from a citizen that we take a certain action, we're, we're declining to do it, but I, I don't see under the 40B rules any obligation to take a formal vote. Mike, am I, am I wrong on that? Oh, I think you're right. Okay. Um, all right, so before Rick, we move on to the next thing, Paul, yes, Rick, again. Yeah, uh, on this point, um, you know, I'm gonna take a wild guess, but I don't think this 61B uh, issue is gonna be decided by May 30th. It, it's gonna go beyond that. And, you know, if you're saying you have to make a decision by May 30th, I think there's other reasons why uh, we're not gonna get there by May 30th, but how can you make a decision and still have this sort of hanging out there. How does that work? It would work this way. First of all, we don't need to make a decision by May 30th. We need to close the hearing by May 30th. Our, 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 we can still have um, meetings of the members for which the public can attend uh, uh, discussing what we wanna do. And, and that is the usual process. And that will, is likely to continue after, let's assume we go to May 31st. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's 40 days after May 31st that we have to issue a decision. And my point in waiting is whatever decision we make on dealing with that issue, I want the most up-to-date facts. So, so Rick, in the event that litigation ensues, um, which could take years, how do you, what, what do you do then? Well, I don't think we decide. I think, I think Craig, you are right. That is a likely outcome um, and litigation often takes years. Um, but I think we, the board will decide what to do with the facts we have when we get to the end of the hearing process. But I think I, I, I agree with both you and Paul that it's unlikely to be final, Paul Boccaccio, um, that it's unlikely to be finally resolved between now and May, but it could be. Um, so that's okay. Go ahead, John. Well, as you said, it could be resolved by the end of May. We don't know. And there's no reason to speculate really on what's going to happen between now and then. And we'll have to deal with the record uh, at that time. Spoken like a trial lawyer. Thank you. Um, Marion. Uh, could you just uh, remind us, uh, you on the ZBA or Mr. Terry, uh, at what point in this process would the 120-day uh, right of first refusal period begin? <clears throat> so that's in chapter... Go ahead, Town Council. 60, chapter 61B, Section 9. So it, <clears throat> it, uh, it happens after there's a, uh, an agreement upon the consideration. So the process calls for us to give him the landowner appraisal. If he doesn't approve of that appraisal, he gives us a counter. If we don't want to come to agreement, then we, we hire a third, and we get a third appraisal. And that, at that point, that's the price. And then, uh, and then we once they decide, okay, that's we're moving forward, then there's a 120 day period to give them a purchase and sale agreement, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> However, you know, in this case, if there's a disagreement about that, <clears throat> excuse me, you can almost be guaranteed that we'll end up in court. And so the, the timeline will, in the 120 day period will go out the window because it will be essentially a freezing of, every, of the status quo. Mr. Haberty, any dissent? Oh, no, I, I, I do agree that more likely than not, this is something that's going to wind up in litigation. Uh, we're trying to avoid that, but it, it may be inevitable. Um, and if and when it does, then it, it will be held status quo until it's resolved. Fair enough. All right, uh, before we move away from 61B, any further uh, commentary or questions on 61B?
Hearing none. Okay. Um, no, item number four on my list, um, the Sherburn Housing uh, Historical Commission, sorry, mm -hmm. wrote on the 6th, asking whether a, a PNF or an ENF needed to be filed for this project because of the, it's in the historic district and the, uh, the impact on the barn and the old tavern property. Um, Town Council, do you have any view on that? Um, I, I do not have an, uh, a, an opinion prepared on that tonight. Um, I think we could hear from the Historical Commission as to uh, why they believe it's on the state register. If, if, uh, if it is subject to a review by, this, by, the, by a state process, that's not something that you can waive. Uh, it would be an additional process they would have to go through. Uh, but frankly, I didn't look at that closely enough uh, to give you a, a hard opinion tonight. Okay. Uh, Mr. Haverty, you, you saw the letter. Do you have any thoughts yeah. on whether or not you need to make any filing here? So we're, we are looking into whether or not a filing with Mass Historical is going to be required or not. If it is, that is the sort of thing that's done after the comprehensive permit is completed, but prior to the issuance of building permits or, or demolition permits for anything as well. So, so that's how the process would run. Uh, I'm not 100% positive that a filing is necessary, but we are looking into it and we've contacted um, an expert to, to assist us with that. Okay, so Mr. Terry, if you could look into maybe for next time uh, what they need to file and when they have to file it. I think mm -hmm. that's the question from the Historic Commission. Um, I know that certainly, at least in one another 40B, the, uh, uh, the, his the Mass Historic Commission uh, was actively involved in it and it made a, a, a big difference in the project. So I, perhaps yeah. that was a different experience, but let, sure. let's get some guidance from town council on what's required and when. I'd be happy to look at that and I'll talk to Paul and I'm sure he'll tell me what he finds as well. Sure. And, maybe, make, and maybe you'll agree completely once agreement. again. I don't know. You could be on a roll here. Yeah, I know that's getting a little uncomfortable actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the fifth and final, uh, uh, preliminary to my head was, and Lynn, we probably don't even have to spend much time on it. Um, I think Gino sent you some uh, information, some bids on peer review for uh, for wastewater. Are you just gonna take a look at those and get back to him? Um, I um, Gino sent me a um, revised budget from, <clears throat> from um, your peer reviewer, but I, I don't know that it was on wastewater, he, he sent us the couple of bills that had gone into the town and we're fine with that. Um, Gina, was there something um, in addition to what you sent today? No, that, that's, that's what I sent was the revised, uh, oh. the revised uh, proposal that breaks up the task in, into uh, pieces and... Um, okay, so we, so we do take issue with it for the simple reason that we're not in front of the CONCOM right now, that it seems to separate out the review of utilities from the stormwater management and the site plan when we thought that that's what 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 we you know the peer review that we received the other day it really doesn't have a provision for going through the waivers nor does it have going through the um uh the comp permit so i i think that gino and i really need to work offline with it um we believe that based on the bills that um, have come in so far there's still money in the um uh six is 63g 53g account whatever it's called um, and if the town wants, um, you know, is seeing it's depleted, we'll put more money in. But I think that, that we still um, are a little bit confused by the budget we saw today. Okay. Uh, Gino, if you're willing to, uh, as we say, speak, uh, speak with Lynn offline and try to narrow down those issues um, as the board sort of peer review representative, we would be grateful. Absolutely. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So finally, after all that, Lynn? You had a presentation you wanted to make tonight and an agenda, you have the floor. Uh, good evening for the record, Lynn Sweet, LDS Consulting Group, Wellesley, Massachusetts. And, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that first up on the agenda for today, we are gonna invite um, Michael Milanowski from Allen & Major to give an update on our discussions with FIRE. He does have a plan that he needs to share. Is Does he have the ability to do that?
Uh, he does. I'm trying to see if he's on. He was on. I am huh. here, Jeannie. Oh, I see you. Do you want to share the plan, Michael, or do you want me to? Um, I can share the plan. Okay. And if you can just give the four or five updates that, that we, uh, we did to um, hopefully satisfy the fire department. We can do that. Uh, let me just see. And, and by way of background, we did, we didn't have a meeting with, um, the fire chief as well as the head of the DPW, um, shortly after our last meeting. And we've had some phone conversations with them since then. So this plan is the result of those conversations. All right, can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. For the record, my, my name is Michael Malinowski. I'm with Allen and Major Associates. We're the civil engineers for the project. Um, as Lynn had indicated, we had had a meeting with uh, Chief Ward to go over some of his concerns, uh, specifically for the North Main Street uh, property. And one of the items that he had indicated was the fact that the town of Sherborne uses a stormwater pond that is located out behind um, the current fire station on Main Street. And as part of um, any fire fighting uh, procedures that may happen along Main Street, their normal course of action is to actually drop a line um, from that pond up Main Street to fight the fire. And one of his concerns was is if they did that, that the entrance to Powder House Lane would be, in essence, cut off by the positioning of that hose. So one of the things that we have looked at and provided an option for is to provide a dry hydrant connection uh, located at the corner of Powder House Lane, which would be piped, installed underground along Powder House Lane and would feed our projects and several hydrants that we have located along the run. So you can see that we've got a fire hydrant positioned here along the access road adjacent to our common house slash leasing area. Um, we have situated a fire hydrant here along the first um, landscaped island, as well as one adjacent to the fire, um, cisterns. Um, this addition of a fire hydrant here was the request of the fire department so that um, should apparatus come and utilize the emergency access that they would have uh, a very short run to fire hydrants here. Um, this hydrant in the middle was previously shown. We have also added a fire hydrant that would be directly connected to our um, fire cisterns in this location. So those were the sort of main concerns that the uh, fire chief had, and we have submitted this plan and have actually reviewed it with the fire department. Uh, chief Ward was um, amenable to our installation of this fire line here, which would eliminate him having to run uh, hose down Powder House Lane, thus um, allowing um, access to Powder House Lane for residents either leaving during an emergency or additional emergency apparatus to enter. Um, one of the other items that Chief Ward had asked us to look at is being able to make sure that fire apparatus could enter the property. And I will reshare another So one of the things that we had provided to Chief Ward was um, fire truck turning movements uh, through the site. Um, we not only looked at uh, Sherborne's apparatus or largest vehicle that Sherborne has, as well as the surrounding uh, municipal aid um, groups in their largest vehicles. So should there be a need for it that we could accommodate um, the largest vehicle in most of the communities in the surrounding area. So as you can see by 
this picture, the blue is the uh, wheel path and the green is the overhang. So you can see that the blue in, is maintained within the paved limits. Um, one of the items was whether we could turn a vehicle um, should it enter the site. And you can see that we've provided, um, there is sufficient room for a vehicle to turn. The addition is also a long hunting lane. So a, a fire apparatus that is coming down hunting lane uh, from North Main Street would be able to enter the property. So for this picture, we sh have shown Framingham and Ashland, which have a similar size um, ladder apparatus. We have Holliston as well that we have shown that can maneuver through the site, um, turn around, also enter from Hunting Lane. We have Millis and Dover, Natick, and then Sherborne and Medford, um, showing that all vehicles can enter the property. So that is sort of where we stand with the fire department. Um, we had also reviewed Hunting Lane. Um, truck movements, which um, and placement of fire hydrants, which Chief Ward did not take exception to, um, as to what was previously submitted. Can I answer any questions that the board or public may have? Jeannie, I don't see any. Do you? Uh, no. Okay. Please continue then. Thank you, Michael. So, so at that po this point, we, we do believe that we've addressed um, the issues that were presented in, in the traffic um, peer review um, with regard to uh, fire safety. And we believe that Jeffrey Dirk had addressed um, the remaining of the issues. Um, and um, so we um, wanted to provide you with a quick overview of um, the single family home uh, proposal. Um, and I can try and share my screen for that. Um, so, um, geez, I thought I brought them up, hang on one sec. Um, so these are, these are slightly, we're still, uh, honestly, we're still kind of play, playing around with them. Um, and these are slightly different than what um, than what was um, submitted, um, but essentially, um, as we explained in our letter, that the market has has changed because of COVID. That there's a need for more single-family homes, and the homes that we've designed have have a couple of benefits. One, they're the same size; they're the same bedroom size, but the site itself is much more compact and it's much um, further. It's pulled back from the neighbors. So we think that those are all positives. The other thing is that we've created a, um, a flexible floor plan. Um, the site that I brought up right now um, basically has um, uh, living room, kitchen and study or, or dining room on the first floor and then um, uh, three, three bedrooms above. Um, the second plan uh, that we have um, is one, um, and hopefully you can see it, um, that has a the ability to have a first floor primary bedroom, and um, a and then two two bedrooms above. So we feel that this particular product serves a a wider audience, if you will, people entering the market, people kind of leaving the market that are looking for a more um, compact home and less maintenance. It, it will still be set up in a uh, condominium format so that the roads and the utilities will be maintained by, by an HOA. And I know that question comes up. So I didn't, um, and we had provided um, a, a sample rendering of what um, the site, look, the, um, the, uh, the units looked like. I don't know if you, if you want to see that. Um, um, so the, the only difference between what we submitted is that we've, we've just elongated the, um, the, the first floor um, primary bedroom, we've, we've made it a little bit longer and, and we ended up putting the bedroom behind the um, garage. And that's really what differed from what we put in a couple of weeks ago. And um, I think, you know, the plans are gonna, are, are gonna continue to evolve over time. So I don't know if there are any questions on 
um, the single family home submission. You had a rendering, I think, of one of them in the material. So sure. that it's, on the, me, it's um, on the website. If, if you want to put it up, but people can yeah, also find let me it just, there. <laughs> let me just make sure I can find it. Um, Don't worry. Uh, I am not. OK, well. Uh, Anyone who's interested, it is there in her materials that did go up on the website. And if you can't find it, uh, I'll I'll find it because I remember seeing. I will. I will. I will. <laughs> I'm just about to put my finger on it. Right okay, here. great. We, we got time. So, um, Mr. Garrison. Uh, yeah, Rick. Thank you, John Garrison, 33 Hunting Lane. I just have a process question, and I understand. Can, that can you speak up or get a little closer to your mic, yeah. please? I just have a process question, really, which is, I understand that these recent revisions are are not really substantial revisions. But the plans that we're looking at currently for both Hunting Lane and for that matter for 41 North Main Street are radically different from what was ever submitted to Mass Housing, I think, in when, whenever it was, fall of 2019. Uh, I'm not sure it's a question for this board, but uh, at what point does a developer have to go back to Mass Housing? How, how, how much can a plan change uh, right. over what is submitted to All Mass right. Housing before a developer has to resubmit? <laughs> Fair process question. The, the short answer, I believe, we don't have town council anymore, so I'm flying flying on my own here. Is is it is it a substantial change? And I think under the 40B regulations, Paul, you can protect, you can uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. They have a fair amount of leeway to make a fair number of changes in the plan. Um, I'm forgetting the standard. We had to go through it with another one, but I it, think it's sort of like a, a fundamental change. But certainly, people are concerned about changes in the plan can take a look at that regulation and these changes and decide if they want to bring before the board, hey, wait a second, this is so substantial that you ought to be kicking it out or sending it back or whatever. Mr. Chairman, the, there is a, a substantial amount of leeway to change the, the fundamentals of an application during the course of the review by the board. There's a different standard once the board has actually closed this public hearing and right. issued a decision. <clears throat> and when an applicant comes in to modify that decision, um, but even then, the changes can be somewhat significant and still be considered insubstantial. Um, in this instance, th there is a time for the subsidizing agency to review any changes from what it originally to the project eligibility letter on, and that is during the final approval. Mm -hmm. So the way the way that Chapter 40B works is, you know, the applicant has to get a, a project eligibility letter from a qualifying subsidizing agency. Once it gets that, it can then move forward with the local hearing process with the Board of Appeals. Once that process is complete, we still have to go back to the subsidizing agency and go through the final approval process. And that is when the subsidizing agency will make any determinations as to whether or not they believe that the changes that were made were sufficient. All right, okay. So what, I'm, what, what I might ask you if you're willing is, is if you or Lynn would just write to the board and say, the standard for changes at this point in the process is X, and it's here in the regulations. And that way, people are interested, like John Garrison or others, can can go look. But 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 I think John, listening to Paul and having worked on several other of these, they do have a fair amount of leeway to change it. That's helpful. Thank you. I mean, I certainly <clears throat> view the changes as substantial, but I understand uh, Paul? what everybody's saying. Uh, and again, changes during the course of a hearing process can be substantial. The, the, the insubstantial threshold is applicable to changes that occur after the board has already rendered a decision. During the course of the hearing before the board, you can have very substantial changes because it's still in front of the board. The board still has the opportunity to review and, and comment on those changes and have a peer review of those changes. So as long as you're having that opportunity, there really is there's no harm to the board right and as we noted you know the, the change from the original proposal to the single family houses actually increases setbacks decreases impervious area it's actually a net benefit okay and actually this is my fault i was trying to rec recognize paul patricio oh i'm sorry no no you're both paul <laughs> thanks rick uh, and lynn was talking about transportation in her first point was that intended to cover, as I remember the last hearing, there was a lot of significant open issues about egress and ingress on North Main Street. And it seemed like 
uh, the peer review had to go back with the developer te developing team and try to come up with a proposal. Is that going to be discussed later, or has all that been worked out? Do you know, so, we had, do you know, have we had a final response from the peer reviewer on traffic? I haven't seen a follow up from the last meeting. All right, he, Lynn, he might want to address so, that. Yeah, so just a, a couple of points. Um, the main issue with the fire department with regard to access was addressed by Michael, which is the concern was if there were a fire pipe going down Powderhouse Lane, that would essentially block access so that the addition of the um, the the hydrant and the pipe going under eliminates that concern around the access. The other issue that was raised by the DPW director was that the town is in a planning process. Um, it's unclear to us kind of where in the process of um, trying to create um, a, a better intersection um, where uh, cl close to where our property is and um, has secured some um, complete streets funding to support some of the design of that intersection and um, may or may not be able to apply for some mass works funding. Um, and in fact, having affordable housing is one of the requirements of, of that particular application. So at this point, um, the developer is certainly um, open-minded as to if and when the town is able to secure the funding, the design and the permits for an entryway different than what we've been providing on Powderhouse Lane, but because it's still in the conceptual stages, we need to remain with the access that we have on Powderhouse Lane as well as the emergency access on Hunting Lane. So I'm not sure if that answers the access questions. Well, I, I think it does. Let me play back what I thought I heard, which is um, there might be this interesting new intersection coming um, but but you aren't volunteering to pay for it um, and you're not volunteering to wait for it to show up being paid for by somebody else. Uh, and therefore, and these are my words, not yours. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and therefore your, your default setting is that our access is Powderhouse Lane. And when the traffic peer reviewer comes back with his final word on that, people will, the engineers will either be together or they'll be apart, but that'll be where it lands. And um, I actually may also agree with you on this, but I will say that if and when that happens, we will pay our fair share. And, and that's something for Jeff, our, our traffic engineer, to, to figure out what our share of, of that, that would be. Right. And, and the, that in your sentence is the new intersection. The, the, the new intersection, yeah. So right. that, that was completely new information that was brought up at the last hearing. And it was, sub, it was uh, and I apologize, it was part of our discussion with the, with the fire department. So... Right. Uh, it's a good question. Gino, do we have a timeline from hearing a final peer review from our traffic person? Um, uh, not that I'm aware of, but he could perhaps respond to that himself. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Tom, you need to unmute. I was going to say, and I think the last thing that we owe is some some truck truck um, estimates, and we've we've just gotten those in, so we need to try and. Um, clean those up and put them into layperson's terms. I think that that might be the last deliverable. All right, Mr. Houston, I admit that you were there. Please, please speak for yourself. Well, I've been low profiling it so far, but uh, at any rate, um, yes, as a result of the last meeting, I think the conclusion was that uh, Powderhouse Lane uh, would be blocked during uh, periods when northbound traffic uh, on uh, Route 27 is heaviest, which is during the morning peak hour. And there really is not a viable solution to that. Uh, even re-timing the signal uh, is not going to be effective in terms of shortening the queue of vehicles to the point that uh, you'd have free access to Powderhouse Lane. So uh, there's not really a follow-up to that because there is not a readily available solution. 
Uh, I mm -hmm. have not been part of uh, the discussions that have occurred with the DPW director in terms of an alternative means of access to the site. Uh, we'd certainly be pleased to look at that, however. If, okay. if I may um, respond to that. So the results of our conversation um, and Jeffrey Dirk's point of view on this differs from Mr. Houston's. Um, there is not a fire safety or public safety issue at Powderhouse Lane in the morning. There's an inconvenience factor, meaning that there's a delay. And as the lights change, the cars move through, but there is no public safety issue. Okay. If um, I may respond ahead, to that, that, that's not the measure of an unacceptable traffic impact. Generally, an intersection uh, which experiences gridlock, such as the intersection of Powderhouse and 27 does, that is considered in terms of traffic impacts unacceptable. I would agree that you could get an emergency vehicle through there, but that's not the issue. The issue is a matter of delay and inconvenience, which is how all traffic impacts are measured and there is no readily available solution to that absent a new plan, which apparently is being discussed. Okay, but Mr. Mr. Houston, Michael, if I hear you correctly, please. if I hear you correctly, there's also nothing that you're proposing that this developer can do other than not build. Uh, I have some understanding uh, that this new intersection option may involve an alternative means of access to the developed portion uh, of uh, 41 North Main Street. If that is true, that may present a, um, a viable alternative. Say, say more about that. I don't know that I can say a great deal about it because I haven't even seen the plans that are being advanced. So I'd rather reserve comment until I have a chance to evaluate the plan. Fair enough. Okay, and, and let me rephrase my question, which was probably unfair before, uh, which is uh, assuming the new intersection plan falls flat on its face, can't get the money, can't whatever, uh, what can be done to avoid the unacceptable outcome here? Uh, there, there is no real viable solution. You could sign the intersection, uh, don't block the intersection, but that simply reserves a box in the center of the intersection. And once vehicles uh, try to emerge from Powderhouse Lane, uh, they become blocked. Uh, I will say mm -hmm. that the delay is to the users of this new project along with the businesses that use Powderhouse Lane for access. So during the morning peak hour, uh, future residents would be inconvenienced as would any uh, service vehicles or customers of the businesses that are in that small shopping center uh, adjacent to uh, Powderhouse Lane. So that they'd be the people bearing the inconvenience and the inconvenience would be delay, it is not safety. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Mr. Haverty, did you wanna say something on this? Yeah, I just wanted to address the issue of, of the convenience versus safety. Uh, safety is an issue in which a board can impose conditions or even deny a project under chapter 40B. There is no case law suggesting that an inconvenience, um, even if it you know, is not an ideal situation is the basis for conditions or denial of a 40B application. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so board members, um, we're all listening to this carefully. We will at some point be faced with the problem of, as Mr. Haverty implies, there are um, 
legitimate grounds for us to condition or deny a project. They are not legitimate grounds for us to condition or deny a project. Um, but if we approve it, uh, it's going to be a mess down there. So that's why we all get paid what we get paid. But wait, that's nothing. Um, so but that's why we have these jobs. Mr. Patricio. Um, Rick, I, I didn't mention this last time because <clears throat> I was taking Tom's position of being low profile, but this week I'm not. But for Tom's uh, benefit, I wanted to mention that the discussion of where the traffic backs up, it seemed um, it, it wasn't right last week. And anybody who's come down Main Street pre-pandemic, the traffic backed up around Town Hall in the morning. So it's not you know, backed up at Powder House Lane. It's backed up all the way up to Town Hall. And uh, so it, it's, a, it's a much bigger backup than was portrayed last week. Whether it's relevant or not, I wanted to get that on, uh, on the table. Certainly all of us who've lived in town for 30 years or more can, uh, can give anecdotal support to that. Okay. Um, maybe we can return to, well, last final question for Tom, uh, and, and it's partly directed to Gino. Um, is it clear in Tom's letters that he said there's going to be this unacceptable condition based on inconvenience, but that the safety issue has been addressed? And if not, maybe you might ask him to supplement whatever he wrote before just to catch up on the fire department's latest input, just so we have the, the full story. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I could comment. I don't think we ever raised uh, the issue that there was a safety problem at that intersection. Got it, okay. So it's all, all right. So it, if you characterized it correctly before, then I don't think there's a need for anything anything new. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Traffic question? Oops, sorry. It's Michael Less at 54 Forest Street. I guess I wanted to, whether you're going to clarify with town council, uh, Mr. Haverty's claim or whatever, or the limitations about to what extent any level of inconvenience is rises to the uh, to a higher level or whether you've already got that clarified. Um, I'm sure and, that when we get to a decision and discussion of conditions, there will be lots of opportunities for me to enjoy town council's company. Okay, it's a matter of whether they hear it earlier before they, yeah. as they try to finalize things, but okay. All right. Are, you, are we ready to move on to water and sewer? I think we are. Uh, Mr. Novak? Oh, yes, Mr. Mr. Mills, sorry. I just wanted to, uh, before we get to water and sewer, you know, on behalf of all of the abutters, one of the major issues that we are concerned with is how close these homes are located uh, to the abutters' homes. And the prior, one of the prior iterations of the um, plans had the unit had the buildings very close to the abutters and uh, 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 Mr. Lebarski's representatives have been maintaining that these single family homes are now much further back. I don't think that's the case. And I think that this board should look very carefully at where these homes are positioned and whether they could be positioned much further away, much further away, not just a few feet, which is what uh, we concluded when we looked at the new plans. They appeared to be just a few feet further away, and yet they're being characterized as far, much farther away. So we think that this board should really spend some time looking at these plans and determining whether they can, these homes could be pushed much further away from the abutters. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Malinowski, Ms. Sweet, do you have any position on that? Um, I'm, try I'm trying to pull the plan up right now, but um, I believe that um, the characterization is, 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 is incorrect. I don't know if Michael has the numbers as to how far back we 
uh, pull pull them from the from from the houses, but it it was substantial in in some instances, twice as far as as what it what what it was, and um, so we can certainly uh, provide you with um, uh, the change in in distances. Right, or or maybe just uh, if it's easier to defer him to just run the plan with uh, the old location superimposed on the new, it'll be very intuitive for anybody to see. Yeah. But it's Maybe. but it, but Mr. Chairman, it's not just a comparison of the two plans. It's whether these homes can be pushed much farther away than where they are now. There's quite a bit of land that the, the plan appears to permit these homes to be pushed much further away. And we we really ask this board to uh, look carefully at that issue. Okay. Yeah, and I would um, I would ask that maybe this discussion be tabled until the next meeting after you see the water and sewer presentation because there are there are constraints on the site. There are constraints on the site relative to um, the grading on the site. There are constraints on the site relative to the wells and uh, and other factors. So it's not just looking at a green site and saying you can move a building, you know, over there. Right, and and, and I don't I don't think we need to drive this issue issue to earth. Uh, but Mr. Mills, I guess I would ask you and your group, you don't have to go hire engineers, but if your feeling is that the houses that are in location A ought to be in location B, just sketch it up on their plan, send it in, and then they can respond to it where, where with either that's a great idea or it doesn't work because of X. But let's, let's be concrete. Let's make up a, a proposal okay. if you don't like where they are. Okay. All right, excellent. Thank you. Good, good point. Good question. Um, all right, water and sewer, Ms. Sweet. Yeah, and of course, I finally just finally find the find the plan on my uh, computer here. So we are joined by Susan Honeywell and David Furtado from Onsite Engineering, who have put together a presentation to try and provide an overview to a very very technical matter that is going to be looked at um, by the state in detail um, later on in the process. So I believe Dave is going to be running uh, the presentation. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thanks for having everyone. Hopefully you guys can all hear me. Um, again, my name is David Fumato. I'm the president of Onsite Engineering and uh, I'm here with Susan Honeywell from our office uh, to kind of run through the water and sewer as Lynn mentioned. Uh, we do have a PowerPoint presentation, so um, should I just click on the share screen button and give it a whirl? Go for it. All right. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Still see it? We good? Yes. Yep. All right. Thank you. So, uh, as Lynn had mentioned, uh, we're you know we're here um, to talk about the water and um, wastewater aspects of the project. Um, so, from uh, our firm, Onsite Engineering. Uh, again, I'm Dave Fumato, the president, and Susan uh, Honeywell is here. She's vice president, uh, director of water engineering. So she's going to cover um, the work that's been done to date on the site relative to. Uh, you know, the public water supply aspects. And then, you know, I'll jump back in at the end to, um, to get into, uh, you know, the wastewater aspects of things. Um, you know, granted, it's a, it's a large group. So, um, you know, the thought was be we'd, we'd kind of run through the high level stuff and then engage on a question and answer basis. But, you know, Mr. Chair, I feel like if there's something that you in particular feel is, is very pertinent uh, that you'd like some clarification on, you know, please, please feel free to jump in and, and you know, ask as we go. Right, and, and, and I looked at your presentation in advance. It seemed to make sense to my feeble lawyer's mind, but if you can dumb it down enough for that, that'd be great. Absolutely. We'll try and keep it short, sweet, and to the point. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Susan um, and you know she can get us started talking about the water stuff and we'll go from there. Okay, I'm actually gonna skip ahead a slide, Dave, um, yep. just because I wanna give everyone just an overview of, of what we're looking at. So mm -hmm. this is... Uh, the overview of the site, the wells are in the middle there. 
Um, there were two wells that were installed back in August of 2019. Those were exploratory in nature. They did get permitted um, through the Conservation Commission, but uh, the purpose was to verify that they, there is a viable source of uh, water at the site. Um, to the right is the North Main Street site where the Pine Residence is, and over to the left is the Hunting Lane site. Um, so that just kind of gives you an overview of the project as a whole. So now if we go back to the other slide, uh, this is kind of a zoom in of the well site. So it shows two wells 50 feet apart. Uh, we would typically put submersible well pumps in those wells and they would pump to a common pump house um, where they would then get pump to the individual developments. So you can see the one going to the left, which would go over to Hunting Lane. That would be um, a cross country uh, route and it would uh, require an easement. The one to the right uh, goes to the North Main Street site and that one has previously been shown um, on all of Allen and Major's plans as well. It is uh, direction, it's proposed to be directionally drilled underneath the um, wetlands and the railroad. Um, the site also will require electricity to power the pumps. Um, that's what's shown in red coming down from Hunting Lane and there would be an emergency generator in the event of loss of power. And we would propose to put a propane um, generator in that general location. Again, this is just kind of a big picture um, schematic of what would happen at the well site. And um, let's see, we have a 10,000 gallon tank proposed at the Apple Hill Estates and a 20,000 gallon potable tank at the Pine Residences. In accordance with DEP guidelines, those are sized to store two days of water um, using Title V guidelines to kind of estimate what that uh, water need is on a daily basis. On, excuse me, on your, on your propane generator, is that, um, you know, roughly order of magnitude, uh, like the, the same size as the gasoline ones many of us have to keep our houses going when the, when the power goes out, or is it like one of those behemoths that sit on top of buildings for when uh, the hospital goes dark? Uh, somewhere in between. Okay. Uh, how many uh, how many kilowatts? Okay, all right, so, whatever. It's, it, it's not tiny, it's not gigantic. Please proceed. Okay, um, so there's also pump stations that, again, Michael and Alan and Major has shown on the site plans that would provide water from the tanks to the individual buildings and residents at each individual site. Um, one thing that will need to be cited is treatment if required based on water quality. At this time from the water quality from 2019, which was very preliminary, it appears that there is some iron um, and minerals in the water that may require um, treatment, which is usually either using ion exchange or green sand filtration or um, some type of um, treatment of that sort. It doesn't take up a lot of space. Uh, we would assume that we would put that within this water system pump house so that the water going to the individual sites is treated. So now moving on to the slide that you guys saw before, I ju we just wanna point out that these wells um, and the system as a whole would be permitted through the MassDEP new source approval program. They would be classified as community public water systems, which is um, if you're serving more than 25 people on a daily basis is when it becomes classified in that way. So either of these sites individually would also be classified as community public water systems and together they're classified that way. Um, again, in 2019, we installed two wells. They were both uh, 800 feet deep. One of them yielded about 25 gallons per minute. The other one, an estimated yield of seven gallons per minute. Um, the, also on this plan, it shows a zone one 
uh, radius, which is the smaller circles, which is about 250 feet. And, um, and then the, set, the bigger radius is the interim wellhead protection area, which is about 624 feet. Uh, the next slide just describes what those two areas are. So again, this is a cr critical part of the new source approval program process is that you own or protect the zone one radius around each well. Um, so as it states here, it requires the public water system to own or control the zone one of their wells and to limit those activities directly related to the provision of water supply or to activities that will have no adverse impact on the drinking water quality. So really, if you want a way to protect a land area, there's no better way than to have a well there um, that's regulated by the state. They don't want to have, um, we typically do not pave in those areas. And um, as shown on the plan, it really would just be a uh, pump station and the water mains within that um, zone one area. The interim wellhead protection area is more of a theoretical area that contributes recharge for a groundwater source and it's proportional to the approved pumping rate. Um, that's that larger 624 feet that was shown. Um, and really when we're doing the first phase of the new source approval process, uh, DEP will just review that area to make sure there's no significant sources of contamination within that, um, that protective radius. And the wastewater that uh, Dave will talk about later has to be sited outside of that area. Next slide, I just wanted to kind of go through, uh, if the board isn't familiar with the new source approval process, I don't know how many public water systems have been permitted in Sherborne, but it's a very comprehensive multi-step process that starts from um, citing the source, conducting the pumping test, um, and then writing a complete pumping test report in a very comprehensive design uh, prior to getting approval to construct the source. That um, design includes all components of that public water system. Uh, it would include the wells, the pump station, the water mains, the water tanks, um, all as part of that process. Uh, it's important to note that this is less than 70 gallons per minute and DEP makes a differentiation at 70 gallons per minute. Um, if it's greater than that, then there's a Water Management Act permit and a much more um, stringent uh, approval process that goes with that, that uh, requires MEPA permitting and everything else. But if you're less than 70 gallons per minute, which is which is where we are, um, it's still a comprehensive process, but doesn't have quite the, um, quite the review as the uh, Water Management Act permit. Uh, because it's a public water supply, there's no local permitting through the Board of Health. And as I uh, stated before, the Conservation Commission, we had already received approval when we put those wells in. We had also installed some monitoring well dry points in the uh, wetlands that we monitored over the course of the pumping. And uh, we conducted short duration pump test, which was about four hours long, uh, just to get an idea of what that yield and water quality would be. So uh, moving forward, we would have to file an amendment, um, amended filing in conjunction with the comprehensive permit um, for that other work at the site. So that's kind of an overview of the water system. I don't know if anyone has uh, kind of general questions that I can answer before we hand it over to Dave. Can I ask a uh, follow-up on, on the local Board of Health and um, uh, uh, transcom roles? If I've, if I've read the waiver request, Lynn, correctly and these materials from on site correctly um and let's put aside for right now the wastewater um the only board of health or conscom role going forward would just be 
with respect to this last bullet point that she shows the piping from the wells? Um, there, there is no um, local um, board of health um, um, review process of this. It's done at um, DEP and it's done um, after after comp permit before building permit. Um, there will be um, as part of our application to you um, because our plans include the piping um, going under the wetlands that that is part of our application to you and it is part of the review by the okay. conservation and, commission. And Matt Vitale and Steve Harris both had their electronic hands raised so they're next up. Uh, Matt I'm, I'm picking you first just because I saw yours first. Sounds good. Um, so Matt Vitale, One Mill Street. I think one thing I would just uh, raise to Mr. Novak and the rest of the uh, ZBA is, you know, one of the things we've definitely seen has been water supply issues in that area. But I definitely say, while I don't disagree with the assessment of the role of the Board of Health, my recollection is that there was some part of the 54 North Main project that included some evaluation of the impact on about as well, which feels like it would be, if my recall is correct, even more important in this instance, given the large volume of water from an area where we've seen a number of homes need to redrill wells in the last several years. Did you mean 41 North Main? Uh, the, no, the one that's uh, the 50. I think it's 59. 50, okay. Yeah. Oh, the, 59. Got it. Yeah. yeah. All right. I know what it means. My, yeah. my recollection from that was that there was some pattern of assessment to look at the butter as well. And I remember some detailed discussion of the specific technology that was looking at the water levels, if I'm recalling that. Uh, correctly. I think you are in the 59 right. North Main Street case, uh, Ron, tell me if I get it wrong. Their wells were going to be right next to the abutters wells. No, that's correct. Um, yeah, I, I would just like to add to that. It was on this slide that's still on your screen here. But as part of the DEP approval process, we have to submit a proposal of what the pumping test is going to look like. and that always includes monitoring of at least the direct abutters drinking water wells. That's in our experience, that's what DEP will require. And so that when the pumping um, test report is written, we have to look at all of that data, including the drawdown in the abutters wells and um, if there was any from the pumping test. And, and to my comment would just be to you guys to say, I would encourage you to take as inclusive a definition of that to look at broadly as that impact. I worry that with this larger volume coming out of that pretty concentrated area, there certainly could be impacts. And so just want to flag that for the ZBA in their consideration. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris, you're next. Good evening. Hi, Susan. Um, Stephen Harris, uh, we live at 24 Hunting Lane. If you can go to the previous slide, I think we're within your circle of, and I was just wondering, this is our barn right across the street in our house. And it's unclear to me what this circle indicates again. Could you repeat? Sure, that's the interim wellhead protection area. And it's kind of a theoretical idea of the water that contributes to the well. Um, again, the only regulation is that we cite any large groundwater discharges outside of that um, radius. Uh, if there was underground storage tanks or things of that nature in a commercial area, that would also raise a red flag for DEP. But in a residential area like this, um, regular re residential use is not considered a uh, potential water quality issue to the well. And so similarly, any, to, I'm, oh. sorry, I'm sorry. So, are, are there any impacts on Mr. Harris's use of his property from being in this circle? No. Okay. Rick. Yeah. Um, if, hold on. Uh, yeah. Steve Harris, are you? Or is that? Do you feel your question was answered? Yes, I mean it's it's hard to believe that that volume of water would not impact our water supply. Uh, that was a pretty confident no, and I think that's questionable. Well, I, I, the question I asked her was was, was regulatory, yeah. as in were, were there regulatory impacts on you? I wasn't asking her whether it would make your well go dry. So, thank right. you. 
Mr. Um, Chairman, if, if I, I, if I might. Issue. Uh, no, no, hold on. We're, we're taking people in the, in the order in which they came. And Mike, the lesser is next. Oh. D Dave is the consultant from onsite. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Um, because the screen's I just, up, I can't see everybody. <laughs> and I know. Uh, I just wanted to point out a, a little bit of a clarification that the anticipated well pumping rate from these wells is going to be, uh, as you as is noted, you know, around seven gallons a minute, which is essentially what most people are probably pumping their wells at. So while the volume of water is is greater, it's important to note that these wells aren't going to be pumped at 20, 30 gallons a minute um, because as a public water supply, they're provi providing two days of storage. So the wells are filling the storage tanks. The storage tanks are providing the water. So these wells are not going to be pumped um, at these really high rates. They're probably going to be pumped at the same rates as most of the abutters wells. You know, I have a well in my house and, you know, our, our pump puts out five gallons a minute and it's like about the bare minimum. So, you know, seven gallons a minute, you're not talking about a lot of water. Um, and then I would also, you know, argue that because you have storage and it's being, uh, it's a public water supply that's actually operated by an operator, there is some ability to control how those wells are, are controlled relative to filling those tanks, i.e. that you can use the tanks uh, for a large portion of the volume um, and then, you know, target refilling overnight so that, you know, these wells are being operated at a time when most people aren't using their wells. So it's, it's, it's a balancing act. That's one of the advantages of having a public water supply permitted through the state is that you have that level of oversight and control on the operational side that is greater than you would if it was just a community source or an individual well that uh, isn't monitored at all. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and you know, to, to, to the non-engineer, it sounds like, well, a great deal of water is still drawn. It's drawn in more uh, regulated and level uh, periods as opposed to one big <laughs> sucking sound, right. as they used to say in politics. Um, all right, Mr. Lesser, you're up next. Uh, Michael Lesser, 54 Forest Street. I was going to make a different set of comments, but just before I get to that, I was going to just react to the last thing that was said, that while the rate is maybe not that much of an issue, you're still talking about how many units consuming a bunch of water and that it's still a significant quantity, maybe over time, whether it's you're worried about a drought year or you're worried about just over five or 10 years of the sustainability of the water supply. So I actually find the comments that you, Dave, were just making to be uh, somewhat I'll be a little pointed, uh, disingenuous in terms of the issue of sustainability of quantity of water, um, because we still don't because these people in the surrounding areas and other parts of town have found issues of quantity of water constraints over time. Um, so I don't, I don't find that answer particularly satisfactory, but I'll move on to what I was gonna say about for the ZBA's conditioning, whereas in the slide after this, you talk, they talk about how DEP will specify a pump testing regime and whatever else that that the length of testing and the number of sites that are then monitored, the DEP could probably be, and others could probably speak better to this, but from the last time we talked about this, um, those can be, DEP can be fairly conservative in what it requires. And whether in a town like ours, in an area where we've been experiencing some shortage of water supply, whether the ZBA should be getting some consulting help or some other help about the fact that whether for local issues, we should be conditioning what that water testing should be so that at least that the DEP might not be sufficient and that you have as a town with water supply con concerns, we should be able to develop a test that's maybe even, it's, even though it's wasteful, a more expensive testing time, as well as making sure that it's not just monitoring a butter's well, that it's a much more extensive, which is what issues came up before, a much more extensive set of sites that will be monitored during the, the testing itself. And so those other kind of testing protocols, leaving it to just DEP, I think will be uh, not serving the town well, given our local resource issues and, and constraints. And that I think the ZBA should get some further assistance to actually 
condition the project more specifically um, because of our local concerns. Okay, and Gino, uh, as we're Gino, as we're um, having a, a peer reviewer take a look at this, that uh, Michael's question is a fair question to that peer reviewer, which is, what, given this town situation, is uh, is the right level of testing uh, that uh, that makes sense from the developer standpoint, but is also fair to the town? Uh, I because was... I, I, because I, I did, one thing we can't do is simply say to this developer, we're sorry but all the well capacity was used up by the butters, you're too late. It's like when you say to the developer, sorry, the schools are full, you can't build. Um, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not the way we're allowed to do permitting. Um, so, but, but, your, but your point about monitoring and, and making sure that uh, we are wise here is a good one. Okay. I'll, I'll make another point as to, I'll speak just as a conservation commissioner um, that there's probably a broader set of issues than just the piping that goes through there. I mean, that's also interrelated with the level of testing that's done because the concern came up that that level of water draw right next to the wetland will affect the wetlands itself. And so it's even the conservation commission issues can will be broader than uh, can be related to that supply the quantity of water issue as well as and there's other concerns going on besides just the piping that was mentioned before in terms of uh, the there so I won't go into what they are but there'll be more than just that okay but because our board it, it's a good question Michael but because the ZBA is being asked to rule on and essentially waive uh, a lot of uh, conscom jurisdiction here uh, if CONSCOM or individual members want to weigh in and say, we think you should do X, um, you know, write that down and send it in. We may not necessarily do what you want, but, but now's the time to speak up. Okay, I guess we'll talk about it at our next meeting. Um, Ms. Beardsley, you're next up. But you have to take okay, yourself Okay, Daryl Beardsley, Forest Street. Uh, I, I, would like to know, could on-site remind me as to what the pumping test regime was the last time? What was the duration of the pump test? It was a short duration. So it was four to eight hours. I believe it was four hours um, and a, a step test. So it was started at one rate and uh, the hydrogeologist that was conducting the test would step up if he felt like it could sustain more uh, withdrawal or step down. So that's why there's such a big difference in the two well estimated yields. If you'll see the slide before, I believe this one, um, one was 25 gallons per minute, the other was seven gallons per minute. And that was based on that uh, four to eight hour pump test. And were the wells being pumped simultaneously during that test? They were not. Okay, so uh, that we feel is very important given how close they are to one another, that they are likely you're pumping from one, they're pumping the same water and whether it's from one or the other is an issue. And so uh, certainly we'd like that looked at. And, and even though, um, you know, the point earlier about, well, you're too late, we don't have enough water versus the schools are full. We can build schools, but we can't make more water in town. So it is a very real environmental, physical limitation. So um, certainly extended pump testing to really get a better handle on the dynamics of the yield. And uh, I'd go along with the good monitoring of the surrounding area. and absolutely simultaneous pumping from those two wells, otherwise it's meaningless. And I also agree with the earlier comments that to talk about a seven gallon per minute pump rate for something at a home that is so intermittent uh, compared to something that's gonna be pumping many more hours of the day to fill those storage tanks that then bleed the water into the, um, the, the dwelling units is, entirely different. So um, 
I, I just want, if that's not for your illumination as anyone who was listening, hearing that comparison of the same potential gallon per minute pump rate. Right. Again, I just like to, we understand those concerns and that would all be outlined in our pump test proposal to DEP. And I would just encourage um, whatever feedback you can provide to the Northeast region when we file that. Um, in our experience, they have been um, very aware of local issues. This is why it's um, classified as a public water system so that DEP does look at these greater um, issues in the community. So in my experience, we typically pump both wells at for 48 hours uh, continuously. And then oftentimes we'll pump them then simultaneously for another 48 hours. Um, other times we'll do a five day extended um, duration pump test with both wells pumping. So that will be worked out with DEP during that uh, new source approval process. And, um, and like I said, it usually includes um, monitoring of the abutters wells that are willing and interested in having their wells monitored. Excuse me, when, when does that process begin, Ms. Honeywell? When, when, when do you make the filing with DEP? We, let, let me well, jump in to, to respond to that. That is something that's done post permit. So that, that's the sort of additional permitting that occurs after a comprehensive permit has been issued. Uh, because again, the way Chapter 40B works, an applicant is not required to expend the resources to do all of this additional permitting without knowing whether or not they're gonna get a local approval of the comprehensive permit. Thank you. And I also wanna point out the board is limited in its jurisdiction when it's serving uh, as a comprehensive permit granting authority to the jurisdiction of other local boards. So to the extent that we need waivers of local rules and requirements the board is certainly within its rights to impose conditions with regard to permits and testing and, and things of that nature. But it does not have any jurisdiction to assert itself into state permitting processes, such as the public, you know, public um, <clears throat> process or the, the groundwater discharge permit process. So I, I do just wanna make sure that we're keeping within our lanes, if you will, the, the state has processes that it, it requires for these particular applications and the board doesn't have any authority to oppose conditions that go above and beyond what the state requires. Well, but, but that's, that's true and that's not true because it's certainly true that we can't um, interfere with or condition a state process, but to the extent that you are asking us to waive a local process, a uh, condition related to that local process is within our jurisdiction. Correct, but there is no local process with regards to public water supplies or with regards to groundwater discharge permits. So well, but, but you just put the rabbit in the hat. There's only no local process because you've assumed you get all your waivers from us. Well, again, so, so you can't subject a comprehensive permit applicant to unequal treatment. You can't impose requirements that go outside of whatever your local rules and requirements are. And that's- We, we agree on that. I think we, we, we disagree as, as where that boundary falls. We need not resolve it tonight. That's fine. Um, uh, Mr. Garrison, I think you had your hand up next. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, similar to Steve Harris's comment, I'm another one who falls within the interim wellhead protection area. Uh, I'm certainly concerned about my well, but, but coming at it from the other direction, uh, I noted that it was, you know, puts limitations on uh, land uses and activities. Am I under any additional restrictions on my property by virtue of falling in within the, this wellhead protection area? Hypothetically, if I wanted to undertake construction on my house, my septic field all, is also in this circle, uh, expand my septic and expand my house. Would I be prevented from doing that hypothetically? I want the town to be able to provide Mass DEP. No, generally, um, you know, single family septic systems are uh, an allowed use within an IWPA. And, and that's talking mm -hmm. about at the state level. I do know that the town of Sherborne has um, a regulation through the Board of Health, the water supply district 
protect water supply protection district. Um, I would have to look closer at that um, local regulation. Yeah, no, understood. I understand that I'm currently under whatever restrictions the town imposes on me. I just wondered if there would be additional ones by virtue of this new development. Um, for, for the on-site people, one, one bit of uh, local lore that you may not be familiar, mm -hmm. familiar with. We, we had uh, a situation in the past where there were arguments about people putting in a spite well, a well in a particular location designed to regulate their neighbor's property. Um, so that's one of the reasons why locals are sensitive to that issue. <clears throat> and, and, and Rick, if I, if I could just ask an, an, another question, it's jumping ahead a little bit, but it's, it's responding to, to uh, Attorney Haverty. Um, he said there is no local jurisdiction for stormwater management. Uh, our peer review study, uh, I thought, noted that, that there is no waiver possible from our town stormwater management bylaws and that, that this this project, even though a 40B would still be subject to our town stormwater management bylaws. Is that, does anybody know the answer to that question? That, that, that sounds wrong to me. I mean, we can look, look at where it comes from because the whole point of 40B is to override a local bylaw. It may be that what the stormwater people were saying was there was some state regulation uh, but but if, if there is some town local bylaw on stormwater, 40B blows it up. Unfortunately, that's the way the statute is designed to work. I don't like the statute, but that's the way it works. Right, although, although I would cl clarify, Mr. Chairman, I was not saying that there was a stormwater bylaw okay. that was applicable. I, I was referring to um, wastewater treatment facility requirements and public water supplies. Right. Uh, not enough. anything having to do with local stormwater bylaws. Okay, Michael Lesser, very quickly, and then Craig Mills. Um, I want to come back to, I guess, the comment about what processes happened before and after on this on the water on the water supply quantity testing. Um, I guess I'll, since I'm supposed to address things to you, to the chair, whether to ask whether the applicant is whether if they're going to put off file, saying that they have to that they don't have to file with the DEP on what the protocol would be for the testing until after the comprehensive permit, whether they're willing to at least, have, if we're going to do a peer review of what it is we need, whether they're willing to participate even in, uh, in discussions before you come up with conditions about what the degree of testing will be and how far it'll go. Like, like they keep saying, oh, to abutters, to abutters. I would, some of the issues that came up before is that that some of the monitoring would go beyond just the simple abutters. And there might be more extensive testing in this case and whether our local requirements, as you hinted at, could, could drive a, a condition beforehand. I can't tell whether Mr. Haverty was saying that, that you couldn't even have that or not, but whether they would participate in a process of trying to sketch out what that filing would be with to the DEP and, uh, and get some sort of possible concurrence beforehand, before you do your close the permit. Um, they don't have to file with DEP, but to understand what it is will be requested then as part of with the peer review help and other comment, whether we could find, whether we could adjust that to our process within this comprehensive permit process. And it's not just left to be a black box that they decide to do later. Yeah, let me try to respond to that, Michael, because it's a fair question. Um, with very few exceptions, and there's one superior court judge who seems to feel that certain wetlands filings can't be done, um, uh, it's elective. And the, the dance, the risk reward for developers and, and Mr. Haverty's position is, well, if, if you make these applications while it's still before the board, the ZBA, the ZBA and the locals may may get involved in the process and maybe you won't be able to control the process the way you want to. But the disadvantage is if you wait till after the ZBA process is done, the ZBA has to shoot blind on a lot of these things. And maybe you're gonna wind up with some conditions, enforceable conditions that you would have avoided if they'd been in the process. So that he can speak for himself, but having done a lot of development work, I think that's what's kind of in the back of his mind is trying to manage that, that risk reward. 
And, and that is certainly part of it, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, I, I don't think that there are any local rules and requirements that are applicable to public water supplies or to groundwater discharge systems. If there are, certainly I'm happy to look at that and have a discussion as to whether or not there's any peer review process that would be appropriate, but I, I don't believe that there are any because the state has essentially occupied the field when it comes to public water supplies and when it comes to groundwater discharge. They don't really leave any room for local rules and requirements. They, they are 100% their way or the highway. So, so would it be your position then, Mr. Haverty, that the town can't have even the materials that we've been given peer reviewed? No, I, I certainly think you have the right to peer, to peer review any materials that have been provided. And I certainly think that, so the, I understand the difficulty in that, the, in that the board is being placed in a situation where it is required to issue a decision on plans you know, that, that may be more limited than, than what they want to see. Um, but unfortunately, that's the way Chapter 40B works. Well, it doesn't I, have I, to. You, you, you could have made this application months ago. You could make it while, in, 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 while you're in our hearing. You are well, choosing, as is absolutely your right, not to do so. And, and I respect well, that. Well, and again, that, that, that's also a cost issue. Yep, yep, absolutely. You know, we get it. We need to, to manage the, the costs of the development. And it, it's simply a matter of making sure you've got your local permits before you go for your state permits. Um, and, and I am familiar, by the way, with that Superior Court decision that you just referenced. I don't necessarily agree with it, but it is what it is. So waiting to find a good lawyer who does, but. <laughs> so does that mean that we have no basis to ask? Does that mean we have no basis to ask for, as due to our local conditions, any more to define a better monitoring or initial testing? We might have a continued condition or even conditions about monitoring going in the future, but do we have in terms of defining the what's tested and what's monitored? That do we have any position any any angle to play in terms of doing that well, playing playing an angle doesn't sound like the the, the process the zba is trying to run here um but have any uh, I, I i believe we will uh find through the process of peer review some guidance on what things are rational for us to ask for in the circumstances and what are not because that's one of the questions i'm going to have um and Mr. Sorry. Chairman, we would certainly welcome suggestions from your peer review consultant as to what testing protocols it believes are appropriate. Right. And, and, and if they're consistent with you know, the state requirements, I, I think you'll find that we're agreeable to them. Yeah. We, we, what we can't be do, you know, placed in, in a position of having to live up to testing requirements that are inconsistent with what the state requires. Right. And, and Michael, I, I think okay. I'm, I'm agreeing with Mr. Haverty that there are, his point is that there are real limits on where our board can go here. Uh, we might disagree on the exact boundaries of those limits, but, but they're there. They, they are definitely not nothing, um, is what I would say to you. Um, and I think uh, Craig Mills is next. You. Sorry, you've been waiting patiently. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's a fact that a number of the abutters already have dry well issues um, to one degree or another. If after all this rigorous testing is done, uh, and certainly as has already been pointed out, the testing that's been done is not adequate. But if after all this, the rigorous testing is done and the project is built, and a number of the abutters wells go dry. What is our recourse? And I'm asking that of the lawyers present as well as for the ZBA to think about. Um, right. what, if, what if our wells are become contaminated? What if they go dry? That, that, that is effectively a taking of our properties. And obviously entirely inappropriate. So how do we protect ourselves? Mr. Haverty. 
Uh, well, I mean, I'm not going to provide legal advice to the abutters uh, other than to say that there is a process with the DEP that's certainly an appropriate question that could be raised during that process. I'm sure they get it frequently from concerned neighbors um, when they are reviewing public water supply. Well, I think it is important um, for this board to understand that we, we are hiring um, a water expert um, in order to um, review all of what's been proposed and to um, uh, advise us. Um, uh, I'd like to yield the floor to Paul Bocchicchio, who I think wants to um, uh, make a further comment about that. Okay, but, but, but before we go there, um, to the extent that you hire an expert and that expert has uh, opinions, materials, what should be done, what shouldn't be done, and you're willing to share it with us, we're, we're glad to receive those materials. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we certainly will do that, of course. All right. Hi, um, it's and, and Mr. Well, Chair, I, well, Mr. Well, Chairman, can whoa, I get whoa, 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 a bit of whoa, 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 clarification? Whoa, please. I, I think John Gar Garrison was next. Um, and, and, th and, that, and then maybe Paul. Uh, but no, I'll, but I'll, was that? I'll yield to Paul. Was, was that? Um, uh, was I'll, that I'll, I'll yield to Paul. Okay, but but okay. but you don't get to choose. Um, oh, you okay. Next. You can go first. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I I will I will <laughs> that's, that's, the, uh, a follow on then, and 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 since I right. sort of dragged us into the stormwater, but clearly the the two issues are related: the uh, water supply and the stormwater. Yes, um, reading from the peer review, uh, it says the proposed project is subject to the Sherburn Wetlands Administrative Bylaws regulations, uh, which incorporate the Sherborne Stormwater Management by law by reference. So I'm again, I'm not a lawyer, but just a clarification. Uh, that seems to me to, re to read that this project is subject to our local stormwater regulations. No, sir. But, no, sir, no? because they asked for a waiver of that. And if the peer review are applying behind otherwise, I believe he's incorrect as a matter of law. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and Paul can say it for me, but. Yeah, yeah make me be the bad guy. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll be the bad guy. And unfortunately, that, that one's a, so I, I think there's a misunderstanding there. Uh, he may not have understood that a waiver was requested for the local bylaw. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes. This is Tom Houston. Yes. Yes, I just wanted to say, when we did our peer review, we made it clear that we looked at stormwater regulations at the state level, which are mandatory and cannot be waived. We also looked at regulations at the local level, because while the board has the authority to waive local regulations. The board has not come to that decision. And I think it is appropriate to inform the board the extent to which the project does or does not comply with local regulations, which may fit into the board's decision process as to whether those regulations can be waived uh, without significant damage to the environment. So we went through the local regulations, recognizing that waivers have been requested, but not granted. Perfect. Okay. Th th that th thank you for that clarification, because that is exactly the way the process is supposed to work. Thank you. Um, okay. I know uh, uh, Paul, okay. Paul was next, I believe. Yeah. yeah it's Paul Bukikio. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, two things, Rick. Uh, one, um, sort of following up with what Daryl mentioned earlier, I think it, it should be within the purview of the ZBA to consider the fact that because of the environmental concerns, stormwater, well, septic, and with Sherburn being one of a handful of towns uh, 
out of, I think, 351 towns in Massachusetts that rely, you know, primarily, almost solely on wells and septic systems that it should be within the jurisdiction or the purview of the ZVA to take that into consideration and possibly come to a conclusion that a huge development like this on this type of property cannot happen. So it's not, you know, as Daryl said, you can build more schools, but if the uh, geology or topography of this area doesn't support 88 residences, it just can't happen. And, you know, uh, I, I just think that's something that should be, you know, uh, thought about by the ZBA. And I certainly agree. And, and uh, we will think about it. And we encourage everybody to bring it to our attention. I, I do need to remind everybody the situation we're in here, which is anything for which we turn down this project has to, quote, outweigh, close quote, the compelling need for re regional need for local housing. And that, whether or not we've struck that balance correctly, will be made by the Housing Appeals Committee. And there's a very heavy thumb on the scale in favor of the local housing. So that, that's right. why I'm saying, uh, you know, if you've got something good, bring in something good and compelling. Yeah, I mean, I'm, a, you know, obviously we're aware of that and we're not against uh, affordable housing. It's, right. You know, there's certain areas that it's, you know, not even more conducive is, is not really the right term where it's, you know, compatible. If this was Brookline, Newton, Framingham, any other town where you just plugged them into the water and septic, you know, these issues wouldn't be there. But Sherburn right. is unique. Right. Um, but so but we, okay. we still, we're still stuck with the same statute. Right. Uh, so the second point that what Craig mentioned is that we are hiring a water engineer uh, who's, who's been on the call and is going to sort of look at the plans, hasn't had a chance to look at the plans. And I, I think uh, he just wants to make uh, a, just a couple of comments about what he'll be doing. And obviously we'll share whatever he comes up with, you know, with the board. So okay. uh, okay. uh, if he can raise playing. his hand, Paul, Paul, yeah. if he can raise his hand, I can try to process him okay. in the line here. Sure. That'd be great. Sean? Okay. Um, Marion, Marion is next. I'm, I'm changing the subject slightly to the stormwater issue. Uh, Gino is here. He could probably chime in much better than I can here. But uh, regarding the stormwater, you do have as zoning board of appeals, uh, the decision to, you can make the decision uh, not to grant a waiver. That's in your hands. Uh, I understand that you are reluctant to do that if you don't think it will be upheld. But in the case of stormwater, the state, it happens anyway, that the state stormwater standards are essentially the same as our Sherburn stormwater laws. So uh, deferring to the state is not such a bad thing in terms of stormwater. In terms of water supply, it's another issue. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, very quickly, please. Yes, I'll, a little something new. Michael Lesson with Devo Forest. Um, we're all worried about the water use. I don't know whether it's part of their, I haven't been able to read their proposal, whether they would be willing to uh, submit that they would also try to do more extensive water efficiency and conservation measures, and whether that's something that you're willing to condition. And they can include where they go beyond the normal building standards or, or codes in terms of water usage on appliances and this, that, and the other, that they do whatever they can to alleviate the burden on the water supply and whether the applicant is willing to uh, put that as part of their, their plan to help uh, address some of our concerns. And that you can Sweet. condition that. Then? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, sorry about that. I'm, I'm just, I'm getting a little confused about the discussion of the peer reviewers and, and who's doing what. Um, it sounds to me like the neighbors have hired a peer reviewer to look at this issue that may be on the call tonight, but the town keeps saying, people keep saying that the town needs to hire a peer reviewer. 
And in looking at the revised scope of services and the, the background of the civil engineer, are, is there a suggestion that there is going to be a proposal coming in on behalf of the ZBA for someone else that is going to be specifically looking at these water and sewer issues? Or is the assumption that yes. that's included what's in front of us? Yes, no, uh, no. Um, first of all, uh, whoever the neighbors have hired, he's not a peer reviewer. I mean, in my, in my view, he, he might be the smartest person in the world. He might be the world's best water person. Um, but the peer reviewer is somebody working for the ZBA. And, and has that party been identified? Um, Gino, I don't think so yet, right? We just, we just saw the water stuff for the first time. So I don't think we've, have we hired anybody for this? We have not. We have discussed, um, you know, a, a someone who had been used on a previous project, but there's been no contract or discussions with them so far. All right, so one thing I'd ask you and Lynn to do as you're having your offline conversations about who, who's reviewing what is, let's try to get somebody lined up because the, we are gonna need this peer review. Um, and uh, th that person should be working for the ZBA. Thank you. And the, uh, the other comment right. is that on um, the, I, I, and I think Susan can clarify this a little bit more, that there is, when it does get to the DEP process, there it sounds like there is input that is allowed by by anyone at that point in time. So I I, I know there's been discussion about the fact that the 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 town can't uh, you know rule on this as part of the comprehensive permit, but there the town and the abutters are are not um, excluded from the process when and if it happens. So thank you. Right. Um, can, can I just have people pause for a moment here? Um, I thought I, there it goes. Yes. Okay. So Dr. Dr. Uh, Wang, um, sounds like you want to speak. Um, minor technical problem, but if, but if you're, you're here and can speak up, please do so. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. yes. And, and, and are you representing the abutters, sir? Yes. Uh, I was uh, just recently contacted and uh, I have not really uh, spend uh, lots of time to uh, go through the documents, but I have seen in through the presentations of the project team of the applicant. Uh, and I do feel uh, I have worked in Sherburn also on uh, ODB projects before. And uh, I do feel that Sherburn is a quite a unique town and they are supplied both uh, serviced by both uh, well water as well as uh, septic systems throughout the town. So from that perspective, uh, you rarely find a uh, town nearby in, uh, uh, in, in this kind of setting. So I do, uh, I, I'm hired and as I told the neighbors, uh, I will do my best technically to review all the designs and the study to make sure the impact to their property is properly addressed. I, I think that's what my goal, and I'm, it's not my goal to stop any projects because I have been on the other side of it, but I do uh, want to make sure uh, my, uh, my, my mission or what I'm hired is to make sure, uh, do my best to understand in, uh, so here I can see that uh, the, the well, uh, as uh, the chairman and the chair of the Board of Health raised, it's very valid uh, issues from the testing and from the production uh, or the year of the wells is properly uh, tested, not just a short time. As I know, there's wells, especially bedrock wells, if they're testing in the high water time and it seems like have enough water, but in the long term, uh, in the summer, they may dry out because where the aquifer was supplying uh, the wells is important. So not just at the water level because the total production. So I haven't really getting into it according to uh, uh, the, the design engineer seems like the pump, uh, if the the tank is uh, two days of supply means it's about 15,000 gallon actual daily use according to the Title V. So it means almost 
10 gallons per minute continuously throughout the day to, uh, to pump it. So that volume is quite different. So I, I would like to see uh, the project, the applicant will, will uh, uh, in, in their hydrogeologic study, will do a little bit more in depth to address that concern. And uh, the monitoring is another thing as the neighbors raised the concern is how do we monitor uh, actively using wells? So because their well is pumping up and down, how do we know the monitoring is effective and uh, address to the concern of impact? Because if their well is uh, using, how, uh, what is the technology or the monitoring they are going to use? So I would like to see, it doesn't mean it cannot be, but I have to be uh, convinced and that it can be repeated to, to be checked, know that the monitoring of impact on the neighbors uh, is, uh, is uh, properly monitored and addressed in a long-term uh, perspective. And again, so I know the DEP have their guidelines uh, and I do feel the local board uh, should have uh, the, the right to asking for a proper uh, protocol or modifying for the town, uh, given the town's uh, environmental settings. They are supplying by wells uh, and, uh, and the septic for the entire town. And especially this project is located quite in the central of the town and uh, already have a uh, uh, very densely developed uh, uh, use around it. So it's a competing uh, resource, how, how that uh, competition is properly addressed as well as uh, mitigated uh, so through the design. So yeah, without getting into much of the detail of the design, so that's what I would focus on and then the stormwater, uh, they may be exempted under the local bylaw, but the state uh, wetlands protection act and uh, uh, which include the stormwater management part should be applied here. And uh, so it need to be properly addressed and designed, so. All right, well, we, Thank we, you. We, we look forward to your input. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Malinowski, I think you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, Michael Malinowski with Allen and Major Associates. Um, I just wanted to sort of briefly go over the, the stormwater. Um, we had just recently received uh, peer review comments from Mr. Houston's company um, on Sunday. We have not had a chance to fully respond to uh, the stormwater comments, um, but based on my cursory review, I don't see anything that's outstanding uh, that would substantially change the design or the intent of the project. Um, we do fully um, acknowledge that state standards are in play here and we tend to comply with them um, as we can. Um, I know that the town does have local stormwater bylaws, but I did not see anything in those bylaws that was contradictory to what the state has uh, relative to treatment um, and water quality. Uh, we will definitely need to go through uh, Mr. Houston's comments uh, more carefully and provide a detailed response um, and update the plans as needed. It would, that, thank you, that's very helpful. It would be terrific if your response can call out either that you do comply with the local stormwater uh, regulations in, in each respect, or in the respects that you don't, you know, why not? Because that's essentially what our board will be asked to rule on. Yes, and that's, and that's, we have part of that included in our stormwater management plan that was submitted. Uh, the state does have their sort of 10 standards um, that we need to comply with, but we can sort of elaborate on that to sort of cross reference the, the local regulations as well. That would be helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Lesser, one more time quickly. Michael, are you still, did I forget to lower your hand before? Are you still waiting to speak? I wasn't waiting to speak, although I would still like to know if there's a process by which they might be water efficient or conserving in their designs. Um, 
but I didn't have anything more to add other than waiting to see if they would answer that even uh, as, and they would voluntarily do that kind of thing. Lynn? Hey, would it be okay if we, I, it's getting late, can we um, do the second half of the presentation? Which okay, we, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll defer that as an open question. I assure you that Mike will raise it again. Okay. Uh, let's get, let's get, uh, good, good idea, Lynn. Let's move. A, a, absent uh, compelling objections, I, I'd like to suggest that we do move along to the, uh, uh, to the wastewater. So, Lynn, you're up. Yeah. I'll jump right uh, back in, Lynn. Dave, Dave, Dave's going to jump in. Sorry about that. All right. So, um, to continue, um, as, as everyone is aware, um, this, uh, site is going to be subject to a mass uh, DP issued groundwater discharge permit. Um, so I, I thought I'd take a minute just to kind of maybe talk about that a little bit for, for those uh, members of the board and, and the public who, who may not be uh, as familiar with this as, as they may be with um, Title V. So the groundwater discharge permit program um, was started by the DP back in the 1980s. Um, to date, there have been about a, a, approximately a thousand permits issued uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and they are most often issued to um, uh, developments such as this, whether it be private residential condominiums, uh, rental units, um, you know, or, or some combination thereof, such as, you know, the Apple Hill Pine Residences um, site. Um, these facilities uh, are regulated under 314 CMR5. Uh, it actually has nothing to do with Title V, even though sometimes you hear about, you know, I was talking about Title V flow. Um, that's just a kind of a relic of, of language. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely separate set of uh, regulations um, in Massachusetts. Um, the process is, is highly regulated uh, through MassDP's engineers during um, site assessment, permitting, construction, and operation. Um, the permitting process is going to be in two steps. The first step is the hydrogeological permitting, which is the BRPWP83, which essentially approves the site for a specific quantity of, of wastewater effluent uh, into a, a tested and approved leachy field location. Um, once that area has been tested and approved by the state, um, you are then allowed to actually proceed with the second step, which is um, permitting an actual treatment system, the collection system. Um, and, and at that point, you would get an actual discharge permit. So um, the hydrogeological step, uh, does heavily involve, um, you know, uh, groundwater mounding, uh, flow direction, um, sensitive receptor impacts, that type of stuff, all of which has to be uh, analyzed by a licensed uh, hydrogeologist, professional geologist, um, and, and submitted to the state's own professional geologist for a review and approval. Um, specific to this site, um, we kind of focused, uh, you know, zoomed in a little bit on the hunting lane property because this is where um, the majority of the, the wastewater components are going to be uh, sited. Um, so there will be sewer lines from every building. Um, for the facility on North Main, there will be a force main um, that pumps uh, sewage. So there'll be a pump station on that site. It will pump uh, the, the untreated sewage uh, over to uh, the site, uh, the, sorry, the hunting lane property where it will uh, undergo treatment. Um, the hunting lane treatment facility um, is shown in this area. So this is the essentially the entrance from um, hunting lane uh, as you come onto the property. Uh, the, so this is the area where uh, the treatment is going to occur. And this is the effluent disposal up in the back here. Uh, one thing I'd also point out, you can, you can see that this, this line here, the stash line in the middle represents the IWPA from uh, the wells that are, uh, you know, Susan had talked about previously. So as you can see, the disposal is, is quite a distance away from that, um, which should help to serve to protect that water supply. Um, in terms of, you know, where we're at and what we kind of foresee happening here, um, the treatment system selection and uh, level of uh, treatment will be commensurate with the, the quality, discharge quality limits. And that's, that's a function of the hydrogeology of the site. And it does vary uh, from site to site. It, it's, it'll be very specific relative to, um, you know, what groundwater quality is like and, and what any potential sen sensitive receptors there may or may not be. Um, this leaching field location isn't uh, shown to be mapped on any mass DEP sensitive areas. 
uh, per their GIS. Um, based on that mapping, uh, you know, at this point, uh, preliminary, we feel that uh, treatment's gonna be required for organic material suspended solids and nitrogen. Uh, we also anticipate including uh, ultraviolet disinfection um, for the removal of uh, bacteria and viruses, as well as uh, active odor control. Um, some of the different systems that are, you know, gonna be put under consideration would be, you know, amphidrome, which is a proprietary mixed uh, type, it's, it's a, combination of a different, several different types of technology, membrane bioreactors, uh, rotating biological contactors, and sequencing batch reactors. All of these technologies have a, a very long um, track record with MassDP uh, of both reliability uh, and consistent effluent quality produced. Um, to get into a little bit more detail relative to the system description, um, Raw sewage is going to be conveyed to this area of the site where it's going to undergo um, primary settling. So essentially, uh, what everyone would know is a septic tank. There's going to be, you know, several, a couple of large septic tanks that are going to remove uh, heavy material uh, and any uh, floating material. Then flow equalization to provide consistent treatment. Um, from there, it will be uh, pumped into um, a combination of aerobic and an anoxic treatment uh, systems to provide organic removal and uh, organic completely removal and uh, nitrogen removal. And then um, final effluent filtration where any remaining solids are removed and um, effluent discharge. And again, within this area here, which we anticipate to be the actual treatment facility building uh, will be the electrical components, um, active odor control system, and then the disinfection for bacteria and virus. Uh, destruction. Um, sorry. And then relative to the effluent disposal area, again, this is that uh, the existing house. Um, and back in this area, you can see in these locations, we did some preliminary test pits just to get a, a sense for um, what the soils were like out here. Uh, in this area, there was greater than five feet of um, a sandy loam. Uh, we did uh, some perk tests and the rates were uh, less than five minutes per inch. Uh, seasonal high groundwater was approximately two to three feet below grade based on uh, observed models. Um, and using this information, um, you know, the next steps would be uh, witness soil testing with the DEP uh, to confirm um, this area was suitable. Uh, it would be involved in more extensive testing than just these preliminary test pits. You, you kind of do the corners and in the middle. Um, some borings would be completed, soil samples would be taken, sieves would be taken of those soil samples. Um, and then the wells themselves would be tested for uh, hydraulic conductivity to really get a sense for what the, the quality of the soil is and, and how much water can or can't move through the soil. Based on that information, a hydrogeological analysis will be um, completed to look at um, mounding, groundwater flow, uh, impacts to uh, adjacent sensitive receptors, um, and then a system would be sized and, and designed to meet the state standards of, you know, a four foot minimum offset between that seasonal high groundwater and the bottom of the field. Um, in terms of uh, post construction, um, it's important to note that um, similar to the water that these systems are highly regulated. Uh, there is another set of regulations, 314 CMR 12, which all it talks about is the operation, maintenance and oversight of um, wastewater treatment facilities such as this. Uh, operators are required to be trained and licensed by the state. Uh, they're required to um, take um, contact training hours and, and constantly be recertified. Um, all treatment facilities such as this by permit are required to have uh, operation staff that is available on a 24 hour per day, seven day per week basis. In the event that there's an alarm condition or something like that, there is someone who will, will be available to respond. Um, prior to the startup of the facility, um, any permittee is required to put 25% of the total construction cost into an interest-bearing escrow account, of, and that's real dollars. It's, it's not a letter of credit. Uh, it's an actual escrow account that is funded fully uh, prior to um, final sign-off by the state. Um, that escrow agreement, the state is party to. Um, and this is, a, this is a backstop that serves as a, as a financial means in the event that there are permit issues or compliance issues. Um, there are you know, financial means available to uh, correct uh, any issues that may occur so that 
you know, the residents and, and ultimate, uh, you know, owners of this site and, you know, the people that live there, you know, have some uh, confidence that, you know, there is funds, excuse me, funds available, you know, in the event that, you know, something needs to be addressed. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, testing and reporting, uh, there's going to be effluent testing on a monthly basis uh, of the actual discharge, quarterly groundwater sampling um, as part of this permit and every permit. Um, the data is reviewed on a regular basis by the DEP, um, and they do have the authority via 314 CMR5 to address compliance issues, whether it's issuing non-compliance, uh, consent orders, that type of stuff. Uh, the state also does uh, annually inspect every facility, um, and, you know, talk to the operator, review um, the past year's performance, and, and actually see with their own eyes how things are going, uh, ensuring that maintenance is being done, uh, stuff like that. And I, you know, I, I know I went through that somewhat quickly, but I, I did want to obviously probably get to the question and answer period. So, uh, you know, happy to open up at that point, Mr. Chairman, to, uh, you know, any questions on, on what we covered. Carol Beardsley, I think you're first up. Carol? Had to unmute. Yep. Uh, for active odor control, what specific types of systems are you considering for that? So generally we find that um, what works best is a combination of uh, activated carbon and um, it's a permanganate based media. So uh, essentially, you know, tanks and processes that generate odors uh, have dedicated odor control uh, ducting or piping that's, that, that's brought into the tank. Um, and then that's connected to a, a blower system that actually puts the, the tanks under negative pressure. So uh, any odor that's generated is actually pulled through the, that ductwork into, you know, an activated carbon media bed. Uh, where the, the carbon uh, captures those compounds um, before it gets discharged. So okay. and uh, the media is expendable. So over time, it's going to need to be replaced. And there, there typically are sampling ports to, to actually measure uh, how much of the media uh, is, is bound up with uh, those compounds. And then, uh, you know, the operator will at that point, um, you know, have uh, make that change. Okay. And the reason I'm asking is that some... Um, such systems will use a masking agent in addition if they can't completely knock it out, but that does cause some respiratory uh, or sensitivity reactions from people nearby. So as on behalf of the Board of Health, I would say that that would not be something that we would be eager to have and then have to address. Yeah, agreed. Uh, the masking agent stuff is, is you know, we don't feel that's a, that's a good long-term solution, so. You don't feel it's a good long-term solution. Exactly, right. So but, that, that's why, that's you know, the system would be in, like an activated, an activated carbon where this stuff is actually removed from the air, and the airflow as it goes through, as opposed yeah. to trying to cover it up, so. Okay. And it yeah. sounds like that means it could be a short-term solution, but again, I guess I'd want to know if there was some sort of upset or other other situation that caused the GAC not to operate as you would expect, then what? You know, what could be implemented versus masking? You don't have yeah, to answer so I, that now, but I would be interested to see that. Well, just answer. just generally, I think that the way that the, the, the these systems are configured, um, it's a it's a slow. Uh, the media gets used up over time. So um, it's a creeping failure, I guess is the best way to put it. So the operator will have plenty of advance notice with their own noses that, you know, that they're starting to, to get odors. And at that, then at that point, you know, all the media is replaced and then you start over from scratch. So there really isn't a instantaneous type failure where all of a sudden everything's working great. And then you have these odors that are just uncontrollable, so. Okay, I guess I'm familiar with some that are more instantaneous actual failures, so. Yeah. You may not have seen them, but I have smelled them, so. Okay. okay. Um, John Garrison, I think you are next, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, John Garrison, 33 Hunting Lane. I am the abutter here, uh, whose house is closest to this system. Uh, so David, can you give me a sense of the size of the actual building, both height and, and uh, 
Um, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is certainly preliminary, um, but, you know, in our experience for a development of this size, um, you know, you, you can expect to see, you know, something that's akin to, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a nine foot sidewall and then, a, you know, fairly decent sized pitch roof, uh, typically something that's on the range of, you know, 30 by 40 in terms of footprint. I uh, just one thing I wanted to point out, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I, I, if I wasn't clear, all these structures out here are below ground tanks. So this is nothing that's seen. These are all manhole covers and hatches that are to grade, but every, all this infrastructure is below grade. The only thing that would be seen would be this building. Um, and with, you know, adequate screening and fencing and, and that type of stuff, um, you know, they have a very low profile. Um, it's much smaller than a typical house. Is yeah, there any there, is there any noise associated with operating a system like this? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, typically, we we specify uh, any any equipment that is um, not in a tank, any pump that, that would be below grade uh, is going to be specified with sound enclosures. So um, you know they're they're essentially the noise is mitigated so that you're in the room with it and you can carry on a normal conversation like we're having now. So um, by the time it gets outside, um, you know, they're not really, you're not really hearing them. And I don't have a good sense of scale here on this, on the, you know, sort of larger drawing, but this appears to be within 10 or 15 feet of my property. Uh, are there no setback requirements that re would require a commercial septic system like this to not be installed next to somebody else's residence? No, this the state does have setback requirements to tanks and buildings, um, and I believe it is fifty feet um, for the building itself. So, so this would have uh, to be fifty feet from my boundary, from the property line. Correct. Yep, uh, twenty-five feet. I'm sorry, twenty-five. It's, feet. it's twenty-five feet. My bad. Okay. I'm thinking of something. All right. Well, as you can sense, I am extremely concerned when I think read things like af active utter control systems and hear the phrase creeping failure. So for now, I'll just leave it at that. Fair enough, thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, we have someone identified as iPad viewer. You're gonna have to identify yourself better than that. Oh, uh, it may be me, Susan Tyler. Yes, that's you. I'm not sure what I am. Uh, uh, <laughs> But anyways, that's a discussion for another day. Um, I have a question. I understand from the earlier discussion, um, power outages, there would be uh, generators running for pumping the water. And I've been in town for a long time and Hunting Lane loses power for more than two days at a time. But generators for pumping water, is there also going to be generators running to pump the water from not only the houses on 31 Hunting, but also over at 41 South Main. I mean, North Main. So, I mean, I'm just worried about the noise level for all these separate generators running to run all the pumping stations. I didn't hear anybody mention it regarding the pumping yeah. of the way. Yeah, Mr. Chair, we would, any, any generators would also be specified with sound sound enclosures. Does, does the generator go inside the building, which sounds to be kind of like <clears throat> similar to a large garage, very large garage, 30 by 40, nine foot walls and, and a roof? Um, typically it would be outside in a sound weather, a weatherproof sound flow enclosure. Um, but it, it can, it can go inside if it's, you know, you have to obviously design right. for That's that. Right. All right. Thank you. Okay, um, next, uh, Marion Neutra, and uh, can you specify whether you're wearing your planning board hat or your individual citizen hat, please, ma'am? Uh, yes, this is Marion Neutra, 25 Prospect, citizen of Sherburn. Um, I wonder, I'd like to ask if uh, this type and size and scale of sewage treatment plant has been built by uh, the company that you're going to use uh, in any of the nearby towns or anywhere within driving distance. Uh, so we could go take a look. 
Yeah, it's it it's preliminary in that process. There really hasn't been uh, any final determinations deter uh, made on system size configuration and then contractor. So it's really it's it's impossible to say at this point. Well, I'm I'm asking if uh, a similar sort of uh, sewage treatment system is in the area that we could check out. Certainly, they've been built in this area before. Yeah, no, what I'm saying is the final, so, you know, we could get to a list of groundwater discharge permits that are the same approximate size, but um, the determination on the actual final configuration um, and also who's building it hasn't been, it's not known yet. So it, it, may, it may end up being an apples to oranges comparison. All right, I'm interested that in this sense? design and I thought we could see an, a sample, an example and get some on the ground experience from others that have lived with such a system, but thank you. Okay, um, uh, M. Callahan, Callahan, I think, wishes to speak. Uh, hey, uh, Mark Callahan from uh, 51 Hunting Rain, uh, and I'm in the, <clears throat> I guess it would be the southeast corner of that lot, um, and where the proposed leasing field is, I'm very familiar with, and it's very wet back there. And I'm wondering, you know, how you could put a leasing field in there, as well as the line coming up from the water treatment plant is along the wall, uh, which most of the people on Hunting Lane, that's their property line. And my well is like five feet from, the lot line. So, how does that impact me, Dave? As, as you're answering that, can you can you put up the the uh, the right screen so we can sort of see it? So, thank you. Yeah. Um, sure. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is mostly schematic in nature. Obviously, the 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 line can be it's adjustable. So, certainly can can factor that location into. Um, the final design uh, as needed to, to you know, at adjust leasing, as necessary. At leaching field there, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's wet. I don't know. I mean, it dries out in the summer, no question. But the rest of the year, it's pretty wet back there. And you got Paul Hill that drains down into there. Um, and I mean, it's very wet. I don't know how you put a leaching field in there on top of, wet, of a wetland. So, yeah, so the, wow. the, the process of identifying where the seasonal high groundwater is, is, is critical, and it's the first steps in the process for obvious reasons. To your point, it's, it's really important to, to identify what that water table is and to make sure that um, you're not impacting it. Um, but that being said, um, you know, everybody who has a septic system, um, you know, your, your septic field is draining into seasonal high groundwater. Um, the key is to make sure that there is a minimum separation between the bottom of the field and seasonal high groundwater, wherever that may be. And if that's artificially constructed by, you know, raising the system up, um, that that's perfectly fine. Um, and, you know, like, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the models and the soil out there indicated that it was roughly two feet below grade. So, uh, you know, there will be an offset above that seasonal high groundwater commensurate with uh, regulation to make sure that that offset is maintained and that the water will actually uh, move through, you know, the, the, the place Title V material and into, into what is ultimately groundwater. Um, so, I mean, that's low land and do you have to raise that, you know, yeah, and I think you mentioned earlier that that was only two or three feet to groundwater. Um, I mean, that's lowland. I mean, that's wet. It's like swamp. And um, so you'd have to raise that up quite a bit. And, um, you know, and then I'm also concerned about my well that is right along that lot line uh, where you are bringing all this wastewater up. So. And it is part of the process of, you know, citing the, the leaching and, and the hydrogel, every, all the adjacent wells 
are going to have to be located and identified and factored into this, um, you know, the assessment of the site. Yeah. And certainly that's a, that's a valid concern and, you know, it's shared by us as well as the DEP. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, I, impacts to potable water supplies are, are a very important uh, part of the process. So, so, so isn't it, you know, I don't understand all the processes that every RUF could go through, but um, it seems crazy that, you know, you get all this development and you don't even know whether it really works for the wastewater and the, the water supply, I, you know, it's, but, you know, it's beyond me, but I live here and I know that that's wet. All right, thank you. Um, Paul Patricio, I think you're next. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I think, you know, in a lot of these conversations, I think it would be very helpful if Lynn or someone else leads the ZBA to actually walk this property and to, to so they can understand our comments about well, it's right on top of the abutters, where that sewage treatment plant is gonna be, where the leach fields are. And if, if that can be done, I think the ZBA will have a better idea of how to sort of handle a lot of these questions and comments. And if the abutters can be part of that, to sort of, uh, to understand sort of the totality of the property and where the development is proposed to see whether you think it's reasonable. I know I've mentioned this before that at one proposal by the developer a couple of proposals ago, all the residences were on the other side of the driveway. And now that all the residents are pretty much on the abutter side of the driveway. That's just an example of, you know, it, it, it'll give the ZBA more perspective of what the issues are about where, how, how big things are, where they are, uh -huh. So it's not just hearing, you know, people complaining without ha having your own view of it. Okay. Um, the answer to that lies with <clears throat> Ms. Sweet and Mr. Haverty. They are under no legal obligation to invite the ZBA or anybody else onto the property. Um, some developers choose to do so because they think it's, it's helpful for just the reason you articulate. Uh, some developers choose not to because they think it's just inviting in trouble. Um, and those are my words, not Paul's. Um, uh, Paul, Lynn, what's your reaction? Mr. Chairman, the board is certainly within its rights to hold a site visit and take a view of the site. And we would welcome that. I, I am a little hesitant in doing it with a, a wide open invitation to neighbors, particularly during a COVID crisis. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, well, why don't, why don't you and Lynn take that one back and uh, think about what you want to do on other site visits. We have done COVID compliant site visits, less than 25 people, everybody masks, staying apart, things like that. We've got a set of ground rules from our board of health. Um, so think about what, what might work. Uh, certainly I'd be interested in seeing the site. Um, the other board members might as well. And um, just, just think about that one if you would. Sure. Well, uh, could the board members at least um, maybe through Gino um, express you know, what days of the week and times work for them so that we can, um, you know, want to make sure that the snow is off the site, want to make sure it's walkable, want to make sure that if there are flags that need to be put here and there, we, we can get those out there. So, um, but it would be helpful to know, um, you know, have a consensus, at least from the board members of what works for them. We okay. did conduct a pretty extensive site walk when, you um, when we had mass housing, uh, you know, out, out, out here, um, as, as I recall, but I, I feel like that was before COVID. Um, I think it might have been. I, I, I missed that yeah. one myself. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, we're, we, we, we we're, we're happy to, we'll, G, fig yeah. we'll figure it out. We'll work with you, but we need probably a little bit more information on your end. And I need to connect with Michael about, um, you know, we don't want you walking out there unless we can actually show you where things are. Understood. Safely. Safely. Un understood. Uh, Michael Lesser quickly and then Mark Callahan. Uh, 
I guess I have a question about the process of the analysis of the septic stuff. What will happen? I'm trying to remember what will happen within the comprehensive permit process in terms of any sort of hydrogeologic studies like like when I remember the fields of Cherbourne, there was an air, area of impact analysis. We'd see where the effluent is going from the septic field, where the surrounding sensitive uh, receptors were, such as neighbors' wells, and whether we had to worry about that. And there's two months left. Is that something that was somehow going to all happen in the well, next few months for your? Well, remember, the fields of Sherburne didn't have a wastewater treatment plant. Right. Or pump water supply. Um, right. So, 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 right. so, so what, what, what comes out of their septic system is uh, a very material, di materially different substance than what comes out of a properly functioning wastewater treatment plant. Okay. So, so, so the issues, the, the question is still a fair one, but the answer is very different because what comes out of the wastewater treatment plant while not drinking water is awfully darn close. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so basically that kind of area of impact analysis of what's going to, for the neighboring wells, right. I understand that there's no, there's a public treatment, public water supply here, which is different, but, uh, but just for the neighboring wells to neighbors to feel about what's down, what are they, who's down gradient of what. Um, it, uh, it also seems to me that, that the neighbors have hired a gentleman who has some experience in this area and I bet they will ask him. Uh, just worried about the timing of getting things right. done and resolved. Right. Well, again, um, well, we, we, we want to work with this developer on timing. We just got this stuff, um, well, and we do, not have to, we do not work. have to close our we do not have to close our hearing until May thirty one. That's two months from now, which is both a lot and a little, for the fact that it's in a six month process, and two months from the end of it, you're getting this kind of work that might take a little bit more to review. I have a little trouble with how the six month window works when they could submit significant information late in the process. Well, as I, as I said before, that, that is a, a risk reward for them. They put in no information or late information, uh, they risk getting conditions they may not like. Well, as long as we're prepared to put them on the table. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Uh, Daryl Beardsley, you're next. I just, um, forgive me, but I do need to comment on the near drinking water quality uh, comment about <laughs> wastewater treatment plants. Having my, my managed, words, not everybody else's. Yeah, having managed them for 10 years. Um, there are things that they do very well and will achieve drinking water quality status. And there are things that they do not address, but may not always be tested for or designed for. So. That's that's all a, I can a fair, say a right fair, now. A fair comment. I, I, I accept the correction. <laughs> okay. Uh, Paul. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Oops, have... Wrong call again. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I meant Paul the neighbor, not Paul Paul the lawyer. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, you had alluded to this a couple uh, hearings ago that the. Um, Six month period is the general period, but it is subject to extension by mutual consent. Um, the real big issues here are the issues that are being put on the table this week, storm water, water and septic. And, um, you know, I recognize that those take time for the developer to put together. You know, the hearing started in October and we're getting them now and it's almost April and it's gonna take time for a peer reviewer, undetermined, our sort of reviewer to look at these things and to meet. So I, I think, you know, consideration has to be given by the ZBA and the developer that, you know, these are the real critical things that are the issues here for the abutters and for, and for the town. And so, you know, the May 30 the date, if, if it's not an appropriate date, it's not an appropriate date. Well, um, yes, yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that we might feel it's not appropriate. No, we don't get to tell Mr. Haverty that he has to say yes. Um, right, but again, I, I didn't say part, that. Yeah, right. I, I know, it's mutual agreement. 
Right. And, 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 and what commonly happens is the, the development team, Paul Haverty, I'm not speaking for you, but the development team often doesn't want to hand out extensions hand over fist because then maybe the town drags its feet and is, isn't responsive. Um, on the other hand, when the town is responsive and trying to work things through as constructively and as quickly as they can, uh, many developer lawyers will turn to their clients and say, look, it's in our interest to give these people more time because we want to get the best set of conditions we can. Um, so my experience and, and intent with Paul Haverty would be, let's move the process as, as, as fairly and quickly as we reasonably can and then hope he feels uh, that it's in his interest to extend if we need one. Fair enough. And, and Mr. Chairman, with regards to the stormwater, that information has been in front of you for several months now. It has already gone through a round of review by your peer review consultants. We will be responding to that review, but it's already you know, well underway. Right, but, but the water and sewer is new. The, the water and sewer is new, but it also wasn't something that we were required to submit really any information regarding because again it's a, it's exclusively within state approval jurisdiction mm -hmm. however we did submit it i certainly agree you have the right to conduct any peer review of what was submitted um but ultimately the the more detailed information is going to come post approval we we, we appreciate that thank you um okay don't see any other hands up Okay, um, Lynn, it's um, 9.30. I might suggest that we talk about uh, next steps, a next time. Um, Absolutely, Could, couldn't agree with you more. We appreciate everyone's time. This is, it's con this is complicated information. Um, I would like to suggest that we meet more than once a month in order to meet the um, the May 31st deadline. Um, you may recall that the first few months of this process were spent not on reviewing the evidence on the ZBA application, but on the 61B matters. And as Paul pointed out, the stormwater information was submitted as part of our um, initial filing. In fact, um, we had expected the North Main Street um, site to be peer reviewed at, at the last hearing and we're surprised that wasn't available. There was a little bit of confusion with Gino and I. So my suggestion is that we move to meetings every two or three months that we, three weeks. What, what I see is left um, for the next meeting is that we will get as soon as we can our response to the stormwater peer review. We will work to try and set up a walk for um, the board members, but other than that, um, we've presented um, a lot of evidence to the board. Um, and other than the stormwater peer review and uh, response, I think we owe you some truck trip data uh, and a site walk, then we would want to move to going through the waivers and going through a decision. So that's at least uh, three meetings in the next two months that I see, plus the site walk thrown in there. Okay, and plus, we skip past that. We, we probably will hear from uh, the owner's um, consultant on his views on the water and, and quite possibly the wastewater treatment plan. Um, uh, What's hunting land of butters? Uh, you, you, it sounds like you've just gotten started with Dr. Wang. Um, is there any sort of expected time frame for feedback from him? <coughs> Uh, as uh, as I said, I just got uh, pretty much today to uh, so the water and the wastewater, and uh, uh, one of uh, the uh, lady raised one thing. Actually, I was thinking that to ask. Uh, I probably missed what is the specific technology is going to be used for the wastewater treatment. If that technology uh, used for groundwater discharge permit have been uh, uh, used near or in a similar neighborhood setting. And I can understand the neighbors have a great concern about odor control. Uh, if it is a, a similar uh, treatment plan already built nearby, I think the neighbor probably would uh, be able to take a look of it as a real construction 
uh, to get a sense and it's for mutual benefit because I believe anything get to be approved is through uh, a real life demonstration. So uh, we understand some of the things maybe uh, in the design and the presentation can be perfect, but in the real life, it may uh, have something they can uh, get a better feeling of how that things look like and how that things feel like, and uh, especially for the people living around it. So I think that request is reasonable. So and I have been requested by that. I try to give them examples of that kind of treatment uh, and groundwater discharge uh, permit projects they can go and uh, visit. So. Okay, that is, that is uh, a little off topic of our next meeting. Uh, but Dave, I'm going to put you on the spot and say, if you can't come up with some nearby examples of where these plants are, um, you better say, I can't possibly come up with any nearby examples of what these plants are like. You're, you're allowed to qualify it out the wazoo that, you know, it might be different, but I, th I think you need to give people something they can drive by and say, oh, it looks like that, when it smells like that. Um, doesn't have to be your final design, but <clears throat> I, I can't believe there's not within 30 miles of here uh, another plant like this. Why, and, why don't um, we make that a follow up to? Yeah, right. It's just, nice that, that's discussion. just an easy follow up. We'll, 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 we'll um, work on that offline if you don't mind. Right. So, so, so let, let's go back to the question of timing. Um, I have a timing question. Yes, Michael. Um, did I, I wasn't sure what your process is for getting a peer reef consultant for the water and the septic and whether, whether you have to, whether you're getting new bids and then have to go back to the developer and whether you have to approve it as a board before you go to contract and then they can then start the work and what the time frame is for just getting this stuff reviewed um, and without it bumping up against the uh, only two months left. Okay, um, Michael, we, we, we did discuss that some where uh, Gino and Lynn are going to uh, speak offline between the meetings um, and come up, come up with proposals. Um, so we're hoping not to have to have a series of meetings on the peer reviewer. What I'm hoping is that at our next uh, meeting, we hear from Gino and Len, uh, yes, we've, we, we've selected X, we think the price is Y, they're ready to go. Um, I, I might even be inclined to have them be ready to go and authorized to go before the next meeting if, if they can come to closure on, on, on what should be done. That's the kind of points that I'm worried about is because if you wait two or three weeks for the next meeting and then you vote and then and they have to be okay. waiting for you that then it's then they can't start and then you're not going to get okay. anything within okay. a month. But Michael, please, please let us try to set the schedule. Okay, I, I'm just saying that whether you even want to ask for a little extension now because of Mike, the fact Michael, that please, there. please. Okay, okay. Um, board members. Um, Two weeks from tonight is April 1st. I think that's too short. Um, uh, is it the 13th that uh, Paul Haverty that you said you and Michael Terry were gonna have had to uh, work through your next round of differences? That is correct. Okay. So what if we tried for the 14th or 15th of April, which is, um, and not four weeks out, probably more like three and a half, um, because then we'll be able to get a report on uh, whether you guys are, are have, continuing to have a love in or have, uh, are having a, a more uh, contentious relationship. Um, and that'll we're, be useful. We and have that'll also get, we're so going to have, to have hearings on the 14th. Yeah, Sorry? we have hearings on the 15th. Hearings. So the 15th, the 14th and 15th. No, 15th. Um, 15th um, works. 14th, we already have two hearings. Yeah. More important than ours? Uh, all equally, equally as important. important. It's like your you don't children, have to answer they're all that. equal. You don't have to answer that. Board <laughs> members, could April 15th, which is a Thursday, work? Yes. Yes. Let me all right. Just, let me just check with Michael um, to make sure there's there's a tiny drop of testing that he has to do. I want to make sure that we can get you our information at least a week prior so you have time to look at it. That would be good. You want to check with him now on that? He's here. He okay. can either text, text me or, or, or speak up. 
I, I think we should be able to get um, uh, the peer reviewer had asked for some additional test pits. Uh, we do have several that were conducted by Dave Formato's group on the North Main Street piece. So we do need to touch base with Gary to see if we could dig some holes um, on his property to um, within the, the stormwater basin. So I think one, two, three, I mean, we've got, that'll be three weeks uh, prior to the 15th. So I think we should be able to schedule um, to get some holes dug out there before then. Okay. Um, Thank you. And Lynn, if, if we can get you know, board members and other wh whoever else is invited on the site before then, great. If we can't, it's not a showstopper. It's not a critical path item, but I, I agree it would be good. Um, yeah. Do we want to put two more meetings on, on the books just so that we've got them just because everyone's schedules are so crazy? Well, there's something to be said for that. Of course, we don't know what we're going to find on the 15th yet either. So Obviously, um, if, if we've got to cancel them, we should then, you know, we will. Um, do you think we'd have material progress by the 29th? That's two weeks from the 15th. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, as I said, um, it's up as far as the, the water and sewer peer review is, all you're reviewing is what we gave you and all of it is very conceptual. So I would think that if um, that, that gives a good amount of time for whoever the town hires and, and to go over the way less. So, you know. Well, I, I, maybe, maybe idea. not. Uh, maybe, maybe Dr. Wang will be done with his work. Maybe he won't. And maybe our peer reviewers will be able to simply reach into their pocket and say, we think they ought to do X, Y, and Z for test, testing given these wells and this history here, but it may also not be that easy. So, yeah. So, um, if, I, I mean, if you want to do something on the 6th and the 27th, that's three meetings. So that gives, um, you know, three week every three weeks, maybe, you know, I think. I see. So you're saying day. April 15th, May 6th. Yeah. And the, and the 27th. And May 27th. And May 27th would give us a good opportunity to decide whether we're going to extend or not. Exactly. We'll see. Hopefully, because... hopefully there's a lot of progress. And if not, right. we'll figure it out. If, if not, then we'll have a less pleasant relationship and we'll all live. So all the um, meetings has to be on Thursday. Sorry. Uh, because I have I used to have lots of meetings on Thursday night. So I, I just want to make sure there's any other options uh, can be considered. Um, Thursdays are not a lock in for me. Other board members? Uh, I don't have any restrictions. Yeah, my, I have a constraint. Wednesdays tend to, tend to be the other municipalities that we're working in. I just don't know when they're going to be that far down the road. Tuesday. What, what about uh, what about Tuesdays? Um. I, you know, we'll, we'll, I don't know, Paul, what, what's your schedule looking like for those, those weeks? Um, so we were looking at rather than on the, on the, on the. Th well, the, the only thing we need to do now for sure is continue to one more. And yeah, we're going to do that to the 15th. 15. And we uh -huh. can sort of consider the others placeholders. Um, you say May 6th. Yeah. And May 27th. Yeah, but and we'll know, I, but, we'll know but, by the next meeting what our next round with everybody else right. is. But if we can try to move some of these to a Tuesday or something to try to accommodate the uh, the abutters consultant, uh, you know, if that can reasonably done, I'd like to do it. He's probably going to have some important no, things I, to say. I generally have Tuesdays open. I think I've got a couple that are, are booked, but not too far. Ago. All right. So I'm going to make a motion to the my fellow board members that we continue this hearing. We close tonight's hearing and we continue to April 15th, 2021, 7 p.m. by Zoom. Second. Lively debate. All in favor? Aye. Step oh, yeah, yes. I roll car. No, no back votes aye. Step votes yes. Pitch, yes. All right, Jeannie, you have it. Everybody it. who attended, thank you for hanging in there. It's a long meeting. It's a complicated project. I know there's certainly some frustration. I appreciate everybody's patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good night. Thank you, Rick. Good night. Good night. Okay. Good night.